Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn move related show on the planet Earth, the John Campion Show, coming to you from right here on my YouTube channel. I am, of course, your host, John Campion, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news and all sorts of good things. Ladies and gentlemen, my doorbell rang. I went to the door. There's the UPS man with a big hot toys package of one Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Robert, how you doing today, sir? Fully accessorized, John. <laughs> fully accessorized. That's I thought what you were going to say. You. I thought you were going to say fully assembled. <laughs> and fully articulated. You know and, what I'm saying? Oh, jeez. Uh-huh. Someone's going to make that shirt now. Robert Meyer Burnett, fully articulated. Yeah, somebody give me that. Hey, guys, just going to let you know, today's show may be uh, not safe for work. Just going to give you a little bit of a heads up on that. But we'll get to all that kind of good stuff here in a second. We do have a bunch of things that we are going to talk about here today. We're going to talk about uh, Robert Pattinson's latest comments and why I believe if you're a fan of Batman or a fan of the films at all, you should be really upset by them. We're going to talk about that. And I'll go into my reasons why in that in just a little bit. Also, Bo-Katan has been confirmed to appear in Mandalorian Season 2, played by Katie Stackhoff, who is, of course, did the voice of Bo-Katan uh, in the animated shows. The new Unhinged movie with Russell Crowe, that's now going to be the first movie to open up in theaters. We're going to talk about that and a whole bunch more. But before we do, guys, let's go off the top with this. Now, you guys know, of course, we are living in a lockdown, right? Uh, everything is locked down. We're all you know, kind of just making the best of it that we can. Everything's I said. And one of the more important things is that, at least in the world of movies, one of the more important things is that production on a lot of these shows has been shut down. And that means not only do we not have, you know, great movies coming out right now at this very moment, it means that, you know, a lot of the movies that we've been looking forward to seeing are going to be at least somewhat delayed. Well, just as there may be a little bit of light on the horizon with movies coming back into theaters with Tenet's July 17th date and this unhinged thing that we'll talk about in a minute, it also looks like there's light at the end of the tunnel for production, physical production on movies to maybe start back up sooner rather than later. According to reports coming out here now, it looks like the UK is going to allow big productions such as Batman, The Witcher, and many other shows they refer to go back into production. This is the comment that's coming out of the UK government. It says, the government is working closely with the screen sector to understand how different types of productions can comply with social distancing guidelines and give confidence to people in the TV and film industries that there are safe ways in which they can return to work. This is from the Department for Digital Culture, Media, and Sports spokeswoman said in a statement. Rob, one of the things that's been going on here as, you know, the, the pandemic and the lockdown is not only seeing the course that's taken, but more and more, we are learning how can we deal with it? How can we adapt to it? How can we live in this reality and actually still function to a certain degree? Obviously, the movie production and the film industry has been looking at this very closely. They want to get their people back to work as soon as they safely can. And it sounds like the UK working with the film industry has been trying to come up with certain ways to make sure that happens. And it sounds like we may say, see production going back into work in the UK. Now, it should be pointed out here, Rob, that just because the UK may come out and say, OK, you're OK to go back into production, that doesn't necessarily mean the studios will. I mean, the studios might want to take their own time a little bit, but at least it looks like movies like The Batman, shows like The Witcher may be able to go back into production sooner rather than later. Rob, you're hearing this report. What do you make of this? Well, look, again, as long as it's done in a uh, careful way, I mean, people have to go back to work. Everybody, we, we want to get our movies done. We want to put, I mean, movies employ a lot of people. And it's, the more production that happens, the better off it is. But the problem is, you know, as you know, movie sets are close quarters. I mean, people are, you've got craft service tables. You eat lunch together. Uh, you're working right up, bumping up next to people. They can also be a sweaty place. There's a lot of people hauling cables and gear and everything else. So as long as... You know, it, it's gone about in a very methodical, very safe, very orderly way. People are tested. Um, I, I think it's something that has to happen, like with all businesses. And, you know, if it's done properly with some foresight and planning and due diligence, I think it, it's it's a good thing, ultimately. Yeah, and you're right. A lot of these sets can mean they were saying that on Tenet, like there could be up to 500 crew 
were on set right. at a time for 10. So you're absolutely right about that. Hopefully they can find ways to do this. R guys, what do you think about this report coming out? Do you think, oh, yes, yeah, signs that they they finally might start getting the machine rolling again? Maybe do you think it's a little bit too premature? Maybe they should be more cautious. How do you feel about it? Jump down into the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. Just before we run into our main topics today, I want to remind you guys that if you are wanting to listen or participate in the John Campion Show, but you're commuting, you're, you're driving, you're at the gym, you're at work, whatever, it's not the ideal environment to pop open a YouTube video. Well, the good news is, thanks to our Patreon supporters, there's an audio-only version of the John Campion Show podcast is available for you guys to download and enjoy. It is the pure audio edition of the show. You can go and find that on your podcasting app of choice. And again, thank you to our Patreon supporters for making that possible. Okay, guys, with that down, let's move into our main topics today. And how do we select our main topics here in the John Campus Show? Well, it's really rather simple. You see, you guys come up with them by going anytime 24-7 over to www.thejohncampiashow.com slash contact. Once you get there, you're going to see a form. Fill it out with your topic or question. It's totally free. Hit submit, and then maybe just maybe, you might see your submission featured as a main topic here on the John Campia Show. With that down, let's move into main topic number one. And our first main topic today gets submitted to us by Kyle, who writes, Hey, John, so it looks like the DC app is becoming more irrelevant after seeing yet another exclusive in the form of the great yet canceled Swamp Thing show will now be playing its entire series on the CW. Of course, this entire series was only one season. Why bother getting this app? Because it appears the ship is sinking for it. All right. Thanks a lot for sending that in, man. And yeah, you know what, Rob, you and I have been talking about for the last little while as more and more of these, what were supposed to be DC exclusive shows are now also playing on other networks. Of course, Stargirl is going to be playing on other networks. We just saw that Harley Quinn is going to start playing on sci-fi and others. The latest in the round of that is the very short-lived series, but it was pretty darn good, actually. Swamp Thing. This report comes to us from The Hollywood Reporter that says, Swamp Thing, starring Crystal Reed and based on the DC title of the same name, will become the second DC Universe series to air on The CW, joining Stargirl, whose episodes will debut on the Linear Network a day after they launch on the streamer. The network is a joint venture between the DC Universe backers Warner Brothers and TV studio, uh, CBS TV Studios. All right, so what do we got here? Well, the first thing we should clarify is this. Some people got kind of excited when they heard these reports coming out because they thought that meant that CW was going to do a season two of Swamp Thing. And I'll admit that was kind of my first impression as well. But as I looked more into it, it at least appears, it at least appears that that's not the case. It seems like what the reality is right now is that this is just them taking the season that exists as it is and they're just going to put it on CW. Which is actually not a bad move for CW when you think about it because they've got nothing new to show and they don't have anything in production right now. If they can actually pick up a series that a lot of people haven't seen yet and give themselves some more on-air content, it's a pretty good move. It's a pretty good move on their part. But Rob, it brings up the question again. If all this stuff that was supposedly and supposed to be exclusive and made for DC uh, Universe, the streaming service they have, why does it even still exist? And, and Rob, I know we've we've kind of speculated that once HBO Max really gets rolling, because a lot of this stuff is going to be over there, including a show I'm very, very excited about, is going to be over there. It just seems to me that it is inevitable that the DC Universe streaming app is just going to get folded into HBO Max. Yes, there are the digital comics you can read on there, but that's not what the main platform is meant to be. So I don't know, Rob, you hear about this whole thing. What do you make of it? Well, uh, it's quite interesting because they haven't really said anything about what's happening to the DC Universe app. I mean, there's been no nothing, zero. So I would just assume that, look, I, who knows? What if the Swamp thing does really well in the ratings and maybe they bring it back? <laughs> You know, for a second season, it was a really beautifully made show. I, I really liked it. And I thought that, why are you stopping the show? I, you remember the, when the, they, they put the kibosh on it, like, like, like one episode had one aired episode or something. In. Yep. And, and they, they, it was like, what, what? 
you know, and I know I had friends that were working on the show and everybody was sort of blindsided by it. And there was a lot of great work that went into it. I think one kudos to the CW for picking it up. It was announced, of course, this morning that Doom Patrol is coming back, obviously, on HBO Max on what, June 25th. So to see. So excited for that. I know, right? And and it's uh, these these were great shows, and to see them get this kind of exposure, I mean, how many people are now going to be able to see a Swamp Thing that didn't see it before? You know, I mean, you you didn't have to have an app. Now it's going to be on free broadcast television. You could you could have ten times the audience in one time to- one shot than you did ever. And then what if it became? I would love this if it became a hit. So I think it's great that these shows are breaking free. The HBO Universe, HBO Universe, the DC Universe app, I, I don't think ever penetrated like they wanted it to, even though I was a fan of what they did with it. And I just think that HBO Max, which is sort of consuming all of these other platforms, it's a great idea. It's a one-stop shop. You're going to be able to go and get everything that you need or everything that you want. And if if they can... I, if they can broaden the appeal and broaden the the viewership of these shows, more power to them. I'm really excited about this. I think it's a really interesting move. Guys, question is, did you guys ever watch Swamp Thing? I find that most people that watch it actually quite enjoy I was very late to the party. It was better than I thought it was going to be. What do you think about this move to CW? Do you think, do you have optimism like Rob does that maybe it becomes a hit on CW and maybe they decide to it? After all, we did see a brief Swamp Thing cameo at the end of Crisis on Infinite Earths. Just throw, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. I'm just throwing that out there. What do you guys think? Jump down into the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right. With that down, let's move on to main topic number two. And our second main topic today gets submitted to us by Patreon, one of our Patreon supporters, Don J, who writes, Hey, John. So the trailer for the new Russell Crowe thriller, Unhinged, was just released. The studio behind it, Solstice Studios, they're a brand new studio, by the way, says it will open on July 1st in theaters. It was actually moved up from a September 4th release date. What do you make of this news? And do you think this is a pretty certain sign that theaters will reopen that weekend? Regal has already started promoting its release on their website. All right. Thanks a lot for sending that in, man. And yeah, hey, somebody crashed the tenant party. You know, Tenet has has been Warner Brothers and Christopher Nolan has been really important to them. We want our movie to be the first movie out in theaters. And we've been talking about how Tenet's going to come along. It's been that light at the end of the tunnel. Well, apparently other people have been listening because it looks like this movie, Unhinged, is going to be opening. They moved it to July 1st. Now, the first thing I should say is this. I watched the trailer to this movie. It looks bonkers. This yeah. this movie looks bonkers. And I think you guys know Russell Crowe is actually my favorite actor. Uh, I don't think he's the greatest actor of all time, but he's my he's actually my favorite actor. I thought he looked awesome in this and he actually sounded convincing in this. And I'm watching this trailer and when the trailer ended and I'm not saying this is the greatest trailer of all time or anything, but when a trailer ended, I'm like, oh, man, I wanted to see more. Um, This looks totally weird, totally bonkers. And I really dig what they're doing here. But here's the real story. The real story is, of course, them now moving the release date up to July 1st, which would make Unhinged not only the first movie to open in theaters, it'll be the first movie to open in theaters by weeks, by weeks. Now, this comes to us from Variety, who writes, uh, Gil, this is the executive from Solstice Pictures, who serves as Solstice's president and CEO, said he was convinced to make the move after consulting with theater owners and John Fithian, the head of the National Association of Theater Owners, NATO, who we've been talking about a lot lately, an exhibition industry trade group. He was impressed by the plans they were putting in place to stagger show times, which is something I hadn't thought about before. That's actually a good idea. To stagger show times, enhance cleaning, and keep cinemas free from COVID-19. Yet, Gill acknowledges that it is possible that some key markets will still be closed when unhinged opens, which is, of course, a lot. Now, of course, the best laid plans of mice and men, Robert, the best laid plans of mice and men. <laughs> it's all good for you to have a plan for what you're going to do. As Mike Tyson always used to say, everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the mouth. So it's good that they got these plans, but they're acknowledging and they're realizing that, hey, you know, some cities may be hit harder than others. There might be some local markets that might be still closed when this happens. Might not be. It's still about two months away. But we are feeling confident after consulting with the theater owners and all this kind of stuff. We felt confident enough that we could say we're moving our release date up. 
and we're going to be the first penguin in the water. Rob, it, it, it's, it's an odd, it's an odd move to me. I, I don't know exactly because, you know, we were saying before that for Tenant to work, we felt that the movie theaters needed to open about a couple of weeks before Tenant comes out, get their operation up and running, show some library content, just get some people back into the habit of knowing the movie theaters are open and then they can come back in and have that couple of weeks to lead up to the first wide release new film coming out in theaters, Tenant on July 17th. And that's been making a lot of people kind of uh, speculate that the theaters would probably be open for like a July 1st opening. Unhinged wants to jump the line now and be right there when the theaters open. I, number one, applaud them for the bravado. But is it smart? I'm not I'm not 100% sure it's the smart move, but they see an opportunity here. You know, Rob, they've heard you and me talking about, hey, tenant may be opening, but you know what? Even with staggered screenings and social distancing and limited capacity and all that kind of stuff, it's going to be the only game in town. It, tenant's going to be the only game in town. They're going to make some money. And probably it sounds like Solstice heard that and they're like, you know what? Everybody's saying that's probably right. Let us let us be the first in line and try this out. I don't know, Rob. You hear about this move on their part. Smart, not smart, brave, dumb. How do you see it? Well, you know, I think it's a gamble because at first we're going to have to see our people. We're, we're what, a month and a half away from that release date, pretty much? A little over that? And we'll have to see where we're all at in terms of our people going to be going to the theaters then. If they are, if people feel safe, this is really going to be, like you said, the first movie in theaters. And after seeing that trailer, dude, there's some action in this trailer. I'm like, okay, I I'm going to see that. I will roll out to a theater and watch that because like you, I love Russell Crowe. I think this is a cheeky move on their part. I think this is exactly the kind of movie that people will be like, hell yeah, I want to go see some mayhem. I want to see some wrecking shop. I want to see when that semi drives over that police car or whatever in the, in the trailer. <laughs> I was like, okay. Even I went, I was watching it here on my computer yesterday. I'm like, oh, like I literally yelped. And uh, I'm like this, this is exactly, I mean, I don't like to see my man Russell Crowe like as a villain, but that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I mean, he was kind of a villain in LA Confidential. Not really. He becomes a good guy, but I, 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 it's just this looks like the, the 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 kind of B movie that I liked. It reminded me of the trailer for Jonathan Mostow's Breakdown. Mm. Remember Breakdown? Oh yeah. I really, I, any movie that has vehicular mayhem, uh, and that was actually the stomping on the police car. I'd never quite seen that before. It, just the way it was done, how abrupt it was. I mean, maybe that's not exactly how it happens in the movie because it's a trailer and who knows. But it got me. It looked really like, good. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I, I'm going to see this movie. And I think as long as people feel safe and they can do like, here's the thing, you know, I wonder, I wonder about the legalities of things. Like, are they worried about people bringing a class action lawsuit if somebody gets sick because they were exposed in a theater? I mean, I don't even know what those kinds of legalities yeah. are, but I'm sure everybody's looking into that and you'll probably have to have, there'll be waivers at the door or something, but I'll tell you. John, I want to go back to the movies, man. And this looks like <laughs> this looks like exactly the kind of movie I want. My popcorn, a tub of it. I want my giant diet Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Pepper, Doc, Diet Coke. I, and at the ArcLight, you can get wine or beer. I want my smorgasbord of drinks. I am ready to watch this movie. Bring it on, son. Bring it on. You know who this is good news for, too. This is good news for Tenant. And I'll tell you why it's good news for Tenant, because if Tenant does indeed hold on to that July 17th release date, yeah, they lose that luster of being the first film back in theaters, but it'll be the first major film back in theaters. And right. this will help having a new movie be there when the theaters first open the doors. That'll just help the process of getting people, not everybody clearly, but getting some people back into the process coming back in theaters so that by the time Tenant comes out, hey, we already had a new movie in theaters for a couple of weeks. Maybe more people feel comfortable. It, there's a lot of still pieces up in the air, Rob. We're going to have to see how this all plays out. Guys, question is, what do you think? Number one, about this unhinged trailer. I thought it was bonkers. What did you think about it? But secondly, what do you think about this move on their part to actually move the release date up to July 1st, two weeks before Tenet comes out? How do you feel about that? Jump down to the comments section below and let me know your thoughts. All right.
With that down, let's move on to our third main topic today. And our third main topic today gets submitted to us by Sam Sprill, who writes, Another character within the Star Wars universe will be joining The Mandalorian Season 2, as reported by Deadline, Katie Sackhoff, who voices Bo-Katan Kreese, Mandalorian warrior in Star Wars Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels, not to mention she was Starbuck in the greatest TV show of all time, Battlestar Galactica. Uh, she will now be playing the live-action version of her character in The Mandalorian Season 2. Could this be a cameo appearance or even more? All right, thanks a lot for sending that in, man. And yep. We've been hearing about a lot of appearances coming from the animated stuff coming in. Of course, we heard about the, it, it look, I mean, it still hasn't been 100% confirmed, but it, it looks like we're going to get the Ahsoka Tano character coming in. It looks like we are going to get a few others. And now we've got Bo-Katan. Now, this is the report that's coming in to us. This comes to us from Deadline, who wrote, Bo-Katan made her debut in season four of Clone Wars, which just had its Caesar series finale. The character has been instrumental in a lingering plotline invol involving the Darksaber in both the storylines of Clone Wars and Rebels. In the latter series, it's Sabine Wren who hands over the Darksaber to Bo-Katan so that she can bring the Mandalorians together. The Darksaber is seen at the end of the first season finale of The Mandalorian, now in the hands of villain Moff Gideon played brilliantly by Giancarlo Esposito. All right. Look, the first thing we should say is this. The moment Giancarlo Esposito came out of that ship and wielding the Darksaber and everybody freaked out, a lot of people instantly started speculating, is Bo-Katan going to be in this? And, and, and it makes sense because, Rob, listen, I'll tell you this. I still feel that same little bit of apprehension about this that I feel about Boba Fett coming back, right? I'm a little <laughs> bit torn because on the one hand, I don't like Star Wars's habit of constantly shrinking their universe and, and making it small and just inhabiting it with characters we already know and we've already seen instead of expanding the universe. That's an issue to me. But at the same time, if you're going to bring the Darksaber in, I don't know how you just ignore the Bo-Katan character. And listen, any excuse to get me some Katie Sackhoff on screen again, whether it's in Battlestar Galactica or whether it's in The Flash, by the way. I love her character in The Flash, by the way. Any excuse to get her on screen is good enough for me. So it, it makes a lot of sense them doing something like this. Rob... You hear about them doing this, and it's just as poetic as she does the voice of the character in the animated series as well, and she's a great actress. Rob, you hear about this. Is this pushing it? Does this make sense? Are you excited about it, apprehensive about it? How do you feel about this? Dude, I think it's great. Now, I, I know you're not a fan of Clone Wars, but I finally caught up with season seven. And those last four episodes of Clone Wars, which basically take place concurrently with Revenge of the Sith, I thought were incredible. I mean, I love them, love them. And I know that you're, you won't because it's all about Ahsoka Tano. You're not going to you know like what? that. I watched the final four episodes. Oh, you did? Because as soon as I heard that Bo-Katan was going to be in Mandalorian and knowing Bo-Katan was in the final couple of episodes, I thought, well, then I really should watch these last four episodes. I don't think they were great, but... I will Come say on. this. I don't think they were great, but I will say this. And this is this is a lot coming from me. I thought it was the best episodes of Clone Wars. I thought they were the I st I still think a, a number of the episodes of Rebels, another Dave Filoni property were even better, but I I never enjoyed episodes of Clone Wars more than I enjoyed those four episodes. I thought well, it was the good, best example. Good. I thought it was the best example of Clone Wars. I, I will give it that. Anyway, please do continue. Well, I, I mean, what what I really liked about, you know, like we're always talking about how the universe is too small. But what I really liked about Clone Wars is the the actual additions to the universe and seeing Ahsoka Tano and Captain Rex and 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 watching how it interacted with a little bit of Obi-Wan and Anakin that goes into Order 66. And it, it, it showed a larger picture of what was going on. I thought that was really clever and really well done. And I like the fact that the Mandalorian is expanding on more of this expanded universe stuff rather than be like, look, bringing back Boba Fett. Uh, yeah. I, okay. But they are creating their own, their own part of the star Wars universe. They are carving out. There's a lot of interesting characters like Giancarlo Esposito's character is very interesting. Uh, Werner Herzog's character is very interesting. So they are, they are building their own thing. And I think that you can't 
the Mandalorian itself, the actual show, every time you think about it, you can't not think about Boba Fett. He's almost like the elephant in the room that nobody's talking mm. about. Like, what happened to him? So to deal with Boba Fett, you're you're sort of getting – you're finally just dealing with it. It's like, okay, here we go. And, and whether he's going to be a big part of it or not, whether he comes and goes, it's fine. I don't care. But it finally like – is the Mandalorian just the Boba Fett TV show, but not called the Boba Fett TV show? I mean, it'll get rid of all that. And in a way, I think it kind of helps the show. But we'll see. I, I, I mean, I, I, I've always enjoyed the Clone Wars, and I, I've liked the expanded universe stuff that they've done. And I want to see them do more of that because, frankly, after Rise of Skywalker, which, which makes my interest in another Star Wars movie, unless it's really good and has some really interesting direction to go in... I'm far more interested in watching the Star Wars universe move forward with what they're doing away from the movies. And that's kind of sad. I never would have, have thought that to be the case, especially on the 40th anniversary of Empire Strikes Back looming uh, next week. It's just, you know, it's crazy. But Dude, don't, don't I, even I, get me started on Rise of Skywalker. Don't even get me started. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I mean, it's, it, it's, a, it's, yeah, but, but I, I, uh, uh, I do like this idea and I, I, I think it's going to be cool, dude. Dude, like I said, any excuse to get K's sack off uh, on screen, I I'm I good mean, with questions. What? Go ahead. What were you going to say? Well, no, I was just going to say, and to bring that that character on Clone Wars and stuff is 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 such a cool character, you know. And I I just I like that they're doing that because why not? I like the fact that then there's a continuity between Clone Wars, Rebels, and the Mandalorian, which is really kind of neat, and I, I think that's cool that they're doing that. All right, guys, the question here is, what do you make of this? Are you excited about that? What do you think of Katie Sackhoff coming in, playing the role itself? All that kind of stuff. I want to know what you guys think about that. Jump down to the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, with that down, let's move on to main topic number four. And our final main topic today gets submitted to us by Rick Bizarro, who writes... Hey, John, I'm a huge fan of the show. Thank you so much, man. It's been getting me through quarantine every day. Well, thanks so much. Doing the show has been helping us get through quarantine too, Rick. I appreciate that, man. Did you see what Robert Pattinson recently said in a GQ interview regarding uh, to shaping up to become the Batman? He doesn't seem all that committed to bulking up, even stating that if you're working out all the time, you're part of the problem. Does this change your excitement for the movie at all? All right. Thanks a lot for sending that in, man. Appreciate that. And yes, Robert Pattinson uh, recently did an interview in GQ. By the way, uh, I'm a big fan of these big in-depth uh, outlet interviews, like whether it went the Vanity Fair long feature pieces. So I'm a big fan of those. And GQ does some really, really good ones. Anyway, they just did one with Robert Pattinson and talks about a bunch about Tenet, about him dealing with quarantine and all that. It goes into a lot of different things. Now, let me say something off the top here. Before we get into, we're going to start off with this quote, but before we do that, let me get off the top here. For those of you who may not be regulars here on the show, there's a couple things you need to know. Number one, I am a big Robert Pattinson fan. Um, I have been, Rob, I don't know if it's, if it's too much exaggeration to say I may have been the biggest cheerleader when they announced that Robert Pattinson was going to be Batman. When, and when they, I've, I've been all for it. I love the idea of him being Batman. And I, when people would want to argue with me and say, oh, he can't do this and he can't do that. I say, you know what? You clearly haven't seen High Life. You clearly haven't seen Rover. You ha clearly haven't seen Good Time. You clearly haven't seen The Lighthouse. Because if all you're fixated on with Robert Pattinson is what he did in Twilight, then you don't know what Robert Pattinson is capable of. He has become a fantastic actor that high-profile directors want to line up and work with. And I have been waving the Rob Pats, or what do they call them? Our Bats, or whatever they call them. I've been waving that Our Bats flag and happy about this ever since they announced it. So I've been 100% uh, more than a big cheerleader for this idea of Robert Pattinson. Thing you need to understand, number two, I don't think... That Batman has to be, or the actor who's playing Batman has to be six foot four, 280 pounds. I, I don't think they have to be that. You know, I, I don't think, I mean, for, for look at Michael Keaton. I mean, even look at Christian Bale, who clearly got himself in great shape for it. But I mean, that wasn't anywhere near the comic book iteration of Batman. I don't believe an actor has to be 280 pounds of big, huge, solid, rock hard muscle. 
right? So I think Robert Pattinson is a fantastic choice for the role. I think he's an extremely talented actor. And I don't think necessarily that the, the character has to be like, you know, 260 pound chiseled, right? That's not what I think. You have to understand that. To understand why I, as a supporter of Robert Pattinson, as somebody who has been a cheerleader for Robert Pattinson being cast as Batman, and as a fan of the Batman character, that I've taken some serious issue with something in this GQ article. Let's get to the GQ article, and then let's break down what was said. It was said, This was from the GQ article. The film studios hired a trainer. Not to mention they also paid for nutritionists and all this kind of stuff. The studio got Robert Pattinson a trainer. The film studio hired a trainer who left Pattinson with a Bosu ball and single weight and a sincere plea to use both during the pandemic, during the lockdown, while he's not doing anything else except sitting at home. But right now, he says, he's ignoring her. I think if you're working out all the time, you're part of the problem, he says, sighing. <sighs> And by you, he means other actors. You set a precedent. No one was doing this in the 70s. Even James Dean, he wasn't exactly ripped. Pattinson called another uh, called another Zoe Kravitz the other day, who's playing Catwoman in the movie. And she said she has been exercising five days a week. Pattinson, well, literally, I'm just barely doing anything, he says, again, sighing. Now, the GQ writer of the article goes on to point out when he brings up the point about, you know, hey, James Dean wasn't ripped. James Dean wasn't playing Batman. James Dean wasn't playing Batman. It should also be noted here that nobody is ever saying that every role. Rob, you and I were just talking about Russell Crowe. He looks like he's enjoying some pie. You know, Russell Crowe, <laughs> Russell Crowe, who is my favorite actor in the world, but he looks like he's been enjoying some cake and some pie, right? You don't, we're not, nobody's saying every actor in every movie has to be big and ripped and shut. Nobody's saying that. And James Dean never had to play Batman. But Rob, we live in an era now in, in the golden age of comic book movies where we have these titans, these characters that are titans, they're gods, you know, in, in the mythological realm of our pop culture. These are Thors and Hulks and Captain Americas and Superman and Batman. And Rob, here's where I take umbrage with what Robert Pattinson was saying. This is where I get upset and this is where this bothers me. I, when I was cheering for Robert Pattinson becoming Batman, I never thought for a second that he's probably a good 160, 165. He probably, he probably tilts in at a good 160, 165. I never thought for a moment that he was going to take some magical horse steroids and suddenly become this gigantic rip 265 pound monster. I never for once expected that. I never for once thought that. I never for once put that onus on him that he, he had to become that. Never once. Never once. He was never going to become that. And that's totally fine. Rob, the only thing I want from the actor who's going to be playing Batman, an actor who is getting a role that tens of thousands of other actors would kill for and do anything for, a character that is a titan in our pop cultural consciousness. The Batman character is almost as recognizable as a portrait of Jesus somewhere around the world. Batman is an important character to the studio. A studio who has entrusted this iconic character to you and a fandom that the studio and you are asking to get on board with. And I'm one of them. I'm on board. Rob, the only thing I ask of an actor who is blessed and privileged and anointed with this iconic role, this trust, the only thing I ask is give me, as an audience member, your best effort. That's all I ask. Take the role and say, you know what? I'm never going to be 260 pounds bodybuilder, but I'm going to give you my best effort. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. Honor the studio that hired you by saying, you know what? I'm going to give you my best. And my best, because here's the thing, Rob, if Robert Pattinson 
committed to a workout regime. And the best he could do is give us like a 190 pound Batman, like a solid 190. That's all I ask because you tried. Just honor the fandom, honor the fans of this by saying, I'm going to give you my best effort. Because guess what, Rob? Picking up some weights when you're locked up at home and you have nothing else to do anyway, all that is a question of is a question of effort. That's all it is. It's a question of commitment and effort, nothing else. Robert Pattinson has all the talent in the world. He has all the talent in the world. Do you know why Carrie Fisher and Mark Hamill, who are way older than, than Robert Pattinson, why they got nutritionists and started workout routines and did all that kind of stuff when they knew they were going to be in Star Wars The Force Awakens? They didn't have to. What are they going to do? Cast somebody else to play Princess Leia while Carrie Fisher is still here? Of course not. They didn't have to. But as Carrie Fisher said, she owed it to the fans. She owed it to the character to get herself in shape. And at her age, what she did to get herself into the shape that she did for that role, it showed an amazing commitment to the character, to the studio, and it showed an amazing commitment to the fans. Rob, you know, I'm not a big fan of Gal Gadot. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of Gal Gadot. I, I don't think she's a particularly super talented actress. You know, and that's fine. I, I don't think she's the worst actress in Hollywood. But, you know, I, I just being honest, it's my subjective opinion. But, you know, back in 2013, or around that time, when they were talking about her being a, 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 one of the finalists for the Wonder Woman role, one of the concerns, aside from her acting prowess, which was my, my main issue, but one of the concerns was like, I mean, she just doesn't embody Wonder Woman. I mean, look at this. This is her back when Fast and Furious 6 came out. And I think a lot of people would look at that, oh, and myself and yes. myself included. I mean, besides being absolutely stunningly <laughs> gorgeous, obviously. But, I mean, that's not an Amazonian warrior. That's not an Amazonian warrior. But you know what Gal Gadot did that has my eternal respect? Gal Gadot said... I'm going to, you know, I'm going to bring my talent to it, whatever amount of talent she's got. I'm going to bring my talent to it, but I'm also going to give it my effort. Because if I'm going to be Wonder Woman, I'm going to get as close to embodying that character as I can. Gal, again, look at this picture. This 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 girl was never going to be, you know, a female bodybuilder, right? She, no, no matter what she did, she was never going to be some big monstrous female bodybuilder. But you know what she did say? She said, I may not be able to be a big monstrous female bodybuilder, but I'm going to give you my best effort. And you know what she did? She got in the gym and she worked her ass off and she put in the sweat and she put in the effort. Why? Because she wanted to give the fans when they saw her as Wonder Woman on screen. Again, look at the difference between these pictures. Look at the difference between these pictures again. And what has my eternal respect from Gal Gadot was like, you know what? When I get on screen, I may not be the perfect picture that you had in your head of Wonder Woman, but I'm going to give you my best effort to get to as close to that as I can so I can be that manifestation of this iconic character for you, the audience, for you, my bosses at Warner Brothers, and for you, Wonder Woman, the character. I'm going to put in that effort. A great article was written by about Alicia Vikander. Remember when she took over the role of Lara Croft for Tomb Raider? Listen to this. Th this is telling, and this speaks right into it. I'll get back to Robert Pattinson here in just a second, but this is important to tie into this whole situation. Alicia Vikander, and I'll, and I'll read this off verbatim. Alicia Vikander was 117 pounds before preparations for Tomb Ra Raider began, and she was already an Academy Award-winning actress who didn't require physical alterations to play the role in the mind of the producers. But listen to this. This is key. This is important. But to Vikander, 30 years old, I guess she was 30 at the time, but to Vikander, 30, in order to play Lara Croft and enter into that relationship with the audience, one has to look like she can do what Lara Croft can do, or at least get as close to that as possible for the role. She entered into a vigorous regime that saw her add 12 pounds of muscle in order to become the character, and more importantly to her, to honor the fans of Lara Croft, anxious to see the hero manifested on screen for the first time since 2013. Let me read that one part again. 
because this is the mindset of a professional. This is the mindset of a pro who is committed to the character, committed to the studio, and committed to the fans. Listen to this again. To her, uh, she entered into a vigorous regime that saw her add 12 pounds of muscle in order to become the character. And more importantly, to her, to honor the fans of Lara Croft, anxious to see her manifest on the screen, to see the character manifested on screen for the first time since 2000. And three. Do you think Hugh Jackman, when you go back and, and read the interviews with Hugh Jackman, do you think Hugh Jackman had to work out three hours a day and take on that ridiculous meal plan that Dwayne The Rock Johnson gave him? He looked fine in the first X-Men. Hugh Jackman looked perfectly fine in the first X-Men movie. And he could have stayed at that, maybe improved it a little. But when you read his interviews over the years, Hugh Jackman was fanatically committed to wanting to give to the audience as close to what the Wolverine in their imaginations would look like. He was, listen, Hugh Jackman was never going to be as physically large as Dwayne Johnson, Rob. He was never going to be as big as Dwayne Johnson. He just doesn't have that body frame. But what Hugh Jackman can do is, listen, I'm committed to this character and I'm committed to these guys. So what I'm going to do is my best. I'm just going to do my best. That's all it is. And Rob, when a studio hires you for millions of dollars, now I'm not saying he's not making Robert Downey Jr. money. I mean, let's not, let's not get carried away. He's not making Robert Downey Jr. money. But still, when a studio is paying you millions of dollars and hiring you nutritionists and hiring you trainers and all they say to you is, hey, how about, you know, while you're locked at home and not doing anything? Think maybe you could lift some weights? Think maybe you could you know, work out a little bit? No. I'm Robert Pattinson, asshole. I don't do that. Screw you. I don't have time for that. I can't be bothered with that. What the fuck else are you doing, you asshole? You're sitting at home during a pandemic. Where you're making mac and cheese. There's nothing else to do. This company is paying you millions of dollars, hired you professionals to help you, whatever. And nobody's expecting you to be a 250-pound bodybuilder. Nobody's expecting that. All we want is your commitment and effort. And Rob, what this says to me as a fan, what this says to me as a fan, is that he does not have the respect for the character. He does not have the respect for the company that is paying him millions of dollars. Rob, he's getting paid more money to do this movie than almost everybody watching this show is going to make in their entire lifetimes. He's making more money doing this one movie than most of us individuals either participating in the show or watching the show will ever make in their lifetimes. And all they are asking him to do is pick up a fucking dumbbell. Show some commitment. Show some effort. Honor the fans of the character. Honor the studio that's paying you. Hell, honor the character itself. All we're asking for is your effort. And all working out is, Rob, is effort. You're never going to look like Hugh Jackman. But you know what? Give us the best version, physically, as the presence of Batman, that you can. And Rob, let me go back to the one thing that was that uh, Alicia Vikander also mentioned um, in, in that article again. I want to read this one part about the Alicia Vikander thing uh, again. It says, the award-winning actress didn't need any physical alterations to play the role in the mind of the producers, but to her, to Alicia Vikander, 30, in order to play Laura Croft and enter into that relationship with the audience, one has to look like she can do what Laura Croft can do. All any of us are asking Robert Pattinson, is that just be the best version of you. That's all. Just give effort. And if you put in the weights and you put in the effort and you put in the sweat and you put in all that work like Gal Gadot put in for Wonder Woman because she wanted to honor the fans and respect the fans and respect the character, that Alicia Vikander put in because she wanted to respect the character and she wanted to respect the fans and honor the fans, all we're asking is that you try. That's it. Just put in the effort. Just put in the effort. And what this screams to me, Rob, some rich, privileged asshole who I, and I feel like a giant asshole because I've been the biggest fucking cheerleader of this guy. I've been the one going, yay, our pets, our bats is coming, guys. He's going to be great in this role. And he is going to be great. He's a great actor. I have no doubt his performance is going to be great. But it bothers me, Rob, 
when somebody has been given a role that tens of thousands of others would kill to play, when he's been given a job that is going to pay him millions of dollars, when he gets to be in a movie that millions upon millions and millions of fans are anxiously waiting to see the next incarnation of The Dark Knight on screen, and you can't be bothered to pick up a fucking dumbbell. It tells me you're not, you're not there. You're not there. You're not committed. You don't respect this character. You don't respect the fans. Again, some people are going to try to misquote me, Rob, and say that I'm saying that Batman has to be huge and chiseled. No, I just want our bats to be the best version of him. And if the best version of him is 180 pounds, a solid 180 pounds, and he put in the effort, then that's honoring the studio. That's honoring the character. That's honoring us as fans. To sit at home, while his co-star, by the way, while his co-star, Zoe Kravitz, is wanting to honor the studio that hired her and is wanting to honor the fans that want to see Catwoman on screen and is honoring the character of Catwoman by working. She says, nothing else she can do right now, Rob. So why not work out? Why not put in the effort? Why not put in the energy? And, and for Robert Pattinson to say, well, they're part of the problem. You know, James Dean never did. James Dean never fucking played Batman. James Dean wasn't around in an era when we were bringing these mythological, larger-than-life titans to the big screen. And guess what? James Dean wasn't around when we as audiences come with a certain expectation of these larger-than-life metahumans, these mega-humans, if you will. He, he was Robert Pattinson, or uh, uh, James Dean wasn't around during that time. Anyway, Rob, I'm clearly a little bit hot on this. I, I'm, I'm clearly just a little bit hot, hot on this. But to me, when you refuse to put forward 100% effort you disrespect the studios that are paying you. You disrespect the fans that are excited to see you. And you disrespect the character. All we want is effort. Rob, I've I, I, I ranted and raved about this long enough. Anyway, uh, I apologize for that. But your take on, on this whole situation, what do you think? Well, I have a, a, a different take that I would, I, would, I would like to offer you. Something that I got out of the interview that I thought was pretty interesting. He talks about the fact that he was watching the making of Batman and Robin. Right, yes. And he goes on and he talks a lot about that he was a little apprehensive about taking on the mantle of this character and what could he bring to it. He wanted to find what he called like, well, his way in. Like what what was his what was the thing that he was going to bring to Batman that was different than what everybody else bought, brought Looking to for, Batman. Looking for what's his angle on it? Yeah, it was it was really what is interesting. His angle? And and so okay, I would say that he might not be work – look, he already did transform his body, and there's obviously maintenance that has to go into that. And he was admitting that, yes, I'm, I'm not working out as much as I should or maybe not at all. But what he was doing is he's studying what other people have brought to the character. He's watching – I mean if you're watching the making of Batman and Robin, you're diving deep into what's out there. He's doing the research and he's looking into how is he going to make this character his own? How is he going to make it unique? How is he not going to do Keaton? How is he not going to do Clooney or Kilmer, you know, or Christian Bale or, or uh, Ben Affleck? And when I was reading that, I found that really interesting to know that he, he was now diving into, he said he already figured out a way but he's still doing research. Even in this lockdown mode, he's he's really, I mean, he, as, as far as I know, maybe he's going back and watching Adam West and Burt Ward episodes of the 66 Batman. I mean, I, I don't know, but I saw it as while, look, taking a break from working out, working out is a grueling. I watched Brandon Routh. I filmed Brandon Routh doing it on Superman Returns, and it was brutal. And that guy, Brandon, completely transformed himself on Superman Returns, and he did get huge. Like, his shoulders and arms were gigantic compared to the way they were when he first got the role. But but so uh, what I want to see is I want to see a character brought to life. And I think that Robert Pattinson, from an acting standpoint um, – is taking it seriously and he is doing I, like, I've never heard an actor talk about watching making of documentaries when they're in quarantine about other iterations of the character that you're playing and and wanting to find something that you and he said he flat out says in that article he says you know I've discovered my way into this character I know how I'm going to make this mine and make this unique and from my perspective I was like 
that made me excited about what he's doing. I was like, that's really interesting. And it made me, I, I kind of had the opposite reaction that, that you had because I wasn't, again, I wasn't focusing on the physicality of it. I was more focusing on, well, maybe the fact that having made making of documentaries, I'm like, it's pretty cool that actors are watching making of documentaries, you know, but, but still I felt like from an intellectual standpoint, he is doing the homework and he is being contemplative about what he wants to bring to this character. And he is thinking about it and, and mulling over it and making sure that what he's doing is unique. And it made me think, okay, we're going to get something we haven't seen before as far as Batman is concerned. And I, I got it kind of excited. That was my takeaway from, from the article, which is again, it doesn't mean that your takeaway is wrong or anything. We just came at it from different perspectives. I got something different out of it, and I wasn't paying much attention to the – I thought that was kind of like, yeah, I, you're probably taking a break because it's probably pretty brutal. But I, I didn't think the guy was going to turn into the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man during quarantine either. I mean that's not what I took away from it. Yeah, I, I see. I – to me, Robert Pattinson, the issue with him was never going to be his acting ability because you guys have heard me for months drone on and on and on about how good of an actor Robert Pattinson is. But, you know, what you just described is exactly what Jared Leto did going into uh, when he went into Suicide Squad. He looked at all the other Jokers. He tried to find his own expression of Joker and working with the thing and all that kind of stuff. And, and great. But that's what an actor is supposed to do. Yeah. It's, you know, when when Leisha Vikander was playing uh, Croft, here's the thing. I think it's a fallacy to say it has to be one or the other. You can either try to give a good performance or you can put in the work and effort on the other things that you're not used to doing. I, I don't think it's a true statement to say you've got to pick one. You can't do both. I disagree with that. Alicia Vikander is an Academy Award winning actress. She knows what she's doing. She studies her roles. She she converses with her director. She goes deep into what she's trying to bring on the screen and she's got an Academy Award for it and she's going to get others. But she still went, you know what? To be this character, I love the line that she says in that article. I need to at least do my best to look like, in a visual way, that I can do what Lara Croft is supposed to be able to do. And all it is is effort. That's all it is. Listen, Robert Pattinson, he's just doing what he's comfortable with doing. Study for a role because he is a dynamic, fantastic actor. He's a fantastic actor. I've been saying that for months. But now you're walking into a role you've never had before. You're playing Batman now, buddy. You're playing Batman. So, yeah, do what you always do. Yes, because that's why you got the role. But how about putting in some effort for the things you're not comfortable doing? How about, how about, how about when you're locked in at home and you've got nothing else to do? And the studio, Rob, the studio is asking you to do it. You know, fuck you. I don't need to do that. I'm Robert Pattinson. I, I don't yeah, know. It he, bothers me, dude. It bothers me. Move outside your comfort zone. But we saw pictures of him. I mean, he he probably spent six months working out and and getting in shape. It's not like it's not like he's gonna let himself go and let all that work Rob, go he's away. He's saying he's doing nothing now. He's saying that the trainer is pleading with him to do some stuff, and they're not even halfway through shooting this movie. Like again, Rob, all I'm saying is show me in sports terminology, just hustle. All a coach wants to see when his players are out on the field or on the court or on the ice or whatever, show me you're hustling. Show me you're just doing your best with what you can. Robert Pattinson right now is stuck at home. He can't go out. He doesn't have any excuses. All he's got to do is commit 45 minutes a day, 45 minutes a day, half hour a day, half hour a day to do what the studio is asking him to doing, that they're paying him millions of dollars for to sit around on his ass, to do what his trainer is asking him to doing, and to stay committed to the role. That's all he's got to do. That's all he's got to do. I'm just saying, Rob, as somebody who adores Robert Pattinson as an actor, as somebody who has been so excited about him being cast as Batman, as somebody who has told and tried to convince other people, get on board with Robert Pattinson as Batman, because he's going to do a great job. And I believe his thespianism will be there no matter what. His acting ability is going to be there no matter what. But I just think it's a fallacy to think it has to be one or the other. Hugh Jackman proved it doesn't have to be one or the other. Brandon Routh proved it doesn't have to be one or the other. Gal Gadot proved it doesn't have to be one or the other. Alicia Vikander proved it doesn't have to be one or the other. And if working out during your downtime isn't beneath 
Hugh Jackman, if working out during your downtime isn't beneath Gal Gadot, if working out during your downtime isn't underneath Carrie Fisher, if working out during your downtime isn't underneath Leisha Vikander, then look at me in the face, Pattinson, and tell me why it's beneath you. Tell me why you can't be bothered to do it. And for him to say, you know, the actors are the problem. James Dean didn't do it. It shows me you don't understand one fucking thing about the modern movement of comic book movies and the mythology behind them and what these superhumans represent to us. Again, I'm not asking him to look like The Rock. I just want him to try. I just want him to put in the effort. That's all. Pick up a weight. Lift a weight. You're being paid millions of dollars to do it. Do it. I, I don't know. I don't know. But look, he's going to do, his his performance is going to be great. His performance is going to be great. He's going to look good too, dude. He's going to look good. I I, I I don't know. No, no here's, here's what I'll tell you, Rob. Here's what I'll tell you. He might look, oh, he might look fine. He might look fine. But I'm going to tell you this. He is not going to look as good as he could look. That's it. He's not going to look as good. He'll look fine. But he's not going to look as good as he could have if he had just worked. And that's all I'm but saying. He, but and when you're did, given a character like work. Batman. No, I don't care, Rob. That, so you think Hugh Jackman over his 20 years of playing Wolverine went, ah, I worked out for the last movie. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to do He worked out like a madman for 20 years because he felt he owed it to the fans to do that. Robert Patton said, okay, I put in a couple of months. I got a little tip, but now we're in quarantine. We're still not done shooting the movie and I'm going to sit on the couch. And, and all I'm saying, Rob, is when you're given a character like Batman, when you're given a job by a studio like Warner Brothers and given a character that the fans love and adore and have a certain picture of, put in the extra effort. Get off your ass. Lift some weights. If all the difference in the world is, is that you'll go from looking pretty good to looking even better than you would have, isn't the doesn't the character deserve that? Doesn't don't the fans deserve that little bit of extra effort? Doesn't the studio that's paying you millions of dollars deserve that little bit of extra effort? If the only difference between you looking pretty good in the role and looking even a little bit better is you putting in some extra hours and effort, don't you owe that to the character, to the studio, and to the fans? It's all it takes is effort. It doesn't take anything else. Just effort and time. And he's got tons of both. But anyway. Um, but you raise a good point. You do raise a good point. It's it's good to see. And it just speaks to his, his the way Robert Pattinson is tuned in as an actor for his thespianism. The fact that he's doing what other Academy Award winners like a Jared Leto did or Alicia Vikander did. And that he wants to study, see what, what his angle on the character is. I'm sure he's working very closely with Matt Reeves on that. I have no doubt his performance is going to be great. I, to this day, I have no performance. I have no doubt his performance is going to be great. I just think when there's other people who will never have the opportunity that he has for him not to do every little inch that he can to make this as great and physically the manifestation of a screen that is available to him to do, for him to not do that, I think is downright disrespectful to the character, to the fans, and to the studio that's paying him millions of dollars. But not everybody will see it that way. And that is the great thing about this. This is why I love having you on the show, Rob. You often have these different points of view than mine. That's why I love having you here. Um, but listen, guys, I'm sure we all have different points of view on this. What do you think about all that? I, I, again, to me, if Gal Gadot can do it, why can't you? But anyway, jump down into the comments section. And I'm sure there's going to be a wide range of opinions on this, a huge wide range of opinions on this. And that's the great things about talking about movies is that we are going to have all sorts of different opinions on it. So jump on down to the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys, with all that down and out of the way, uh, we are now going to move on to the live questions part of the show. Now, before we do, though, Robert and I are going to do as we do every day here. We're going to take a quick two or three minute break here. We're going to stretch our legs, rest the vocal cords, refill our drinks and all that kind of stuff, give you a chance to run and use the bathroom yourself. So hang tight with us. And by the way, if you want to send in a question, there's two different ways you can do it. The best way to send it in is to use the tip link that's in the top of the description of this video. You can just go click on that link. It's streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip. Uh, or you can use the super chat feature in YouTube itself. Either way, you will be supporting the channel and your question will get read. If we don't get through all the questions today, we'll do a companion video for it uh, as well. So two benefits to that. All right, guys, hang tight with us. Robert and I will be right back.
and we are back. Thank you so much for your patience and indulgence as Robert and I took a little bit of a break there. And now it's time for us to jump into our live questions. We're going to start off with the uh, tip link questions and then we'll move on. Once we get through all the tip link questions, we'll move on to the super chat questions uh, that have come in. All right, we're going to start things off here with Willow who writes, what did you think of Johnny Depp's performance in Black Mass? I thought he was great in the movie, and I really like seeing him take on a different role from Jack Sparrow or Tim Burton characters. I'll tell you what, Rob, I the movie itself did not turn out to be as good as I was hoping it would be, but I thought Johnny Depp was quite good, and it was really nice to see him actually play more of a serious role after not just Jack Sparrow and not just... Uh, uh, what was that, that vampire one that he did? or and To see him play a character like that, I thought it was really great. What did you think about Johnny Depp in that movie? Uh, well, look, I wanted the movie to be better, but I thought he was great. Uh, you know, I also loved him when he played Joe Pistone and Donnie Brasco. Yeah, um, yeah. And I, 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 my beloved The Ninth Gate, when he plays uh, uh, Dean Corso, who's a book a book peddler. He, he finds rare books and sells them. I, I like when Johnny Depp is doing more of the real world roles, but you know, when he's playing a mobster, um, it, it's, he still gets to bring that flourish to it that only he can do so well. And I thought he was great, but like you, I wish the movie was better. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. But I thought he was a really good Whitey Bulger. I thought he, he did really he good great. in that role. All right. Great. Ryan Loner writes my big controversial star Wars opinion. I've never once cared about Boba Fett as I see it. There's literally nothing to him beyond a neat armor design. And now there's a ton of other characters who have that armor. So what's the point of him? Um, you know what? Th that You're not alone in that. There are there are a lot of people, even Star Wars fans who I've said over the years. Uh, you ever see Parks and Rec, Rob? No, you haven't watched Parks and Rec, have you? Uh, but Little Sebastian, it reminds me of Little Sebastian the Pony, where like the one guy's like, why is everybody making a big deal out of this? Th the Pony doesn't do anything. Some people look at Boba Fett and feel that way. But there are others who feel like the shroud of mystery around him, along with the fact that like he stands and talks face to face with Vader and all the other, you know, the, the ethos that surrounds the character gets a lot of people involved. But listen, Ryan, don't apologize for feeling that way. You're not alone. There are others who feel that way, too. And then there's a bunch of us who actually find a lot of that very appealing about the character. But don't you feel bad about that? All right. Ryan Loner also writes. So, yeah, really not that interested in seeing him in The Mandalorian. Now, if Morrison was coming back as Rex, I could get on board with that. Uh, yeah, there, and by the way, by the way, there is some speculation, because even the Hollywood Reporter story that said Morrison was coming back to play Boba Fett, even in that story they said, but we don't know 100% for sure he's playing Boba Fett. I mean, if you're going to get Bo-Katan and others in there, I mean, look, I... I don't think it's likely that he's coming back to play Rex, but I'm just saying, Ryan, and I'm not trying to get your hopes up, but it's a possibility. It is a possibility. All right. Uh, Brown Eye of the Tiger writes, John, if rumors are true that Iron Mike is training again at 53 and planning on a fight truly mesmerizing and frightening for the opponent, hashtag MAFA, um, hashtag hand deserves no justice. Uh, yeah. So for those of you who haven't heard, I don't know, Rob, if you heard about this. Why but they got to do that on my birthday week, John? Why they got to do that on my birthday week? <laughs> Why can't you just respect the Come Han? Come on, man. Um, there are stories going around that Iron Mike Tyson may be training to fight again, pulling a, a George Foreman coming out of retirement thing. I think it is a brutal mistake. I mean, Iron Mike is the scariest there has ever been. But the fact is, he's 53. I I, I, I don't know. I think it would be a mistake. You, we, but I, hey, listen, Rob, if my Iron Mike Tyson fights on a card, I'll, I'll buy the pay-per-view and watch it. I don't know. What do you think? Dude, I would love to see that. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I well, who wouldn't? It'd be like watching a Rocky movie for real, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, oh, it's... good point. I like that. It'd be like watching a Rocky movie for real. I like that. Yeah. Uh, Damo on, Davies writes, greetings from the UK to add to the recent Disney plus controversy with them editing a uh, naked uh, from behind shot of Daryl Hannah and from the eighties move from the eighties movie splash. They have released X-Men days of future past with the, with the naked from behind shot of Hugh Jackman. Yeah. We've talked about that uh, on this show, Damo Davies before that actually specific topic came up. I think with that is a matter of once you see those movies play on Disney Plus in the United States, I don't think that's going to be there then. I don't think they, I think when they launched things, they just put certain things out in certain territories. But when it comes time for them to open in the United States, I think you're going to see them do something about that. Whether they should or shouldn't is up for debate, but I do think you're going to see them do something about that uh, when it comes time to air it in the United States. All right, Django19 writes, 
One of my local theaters opened up this week, and I have a chance to rewatch The Invisible Man or Harley Quinn. I'm thinking about going, but I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, they will be doing space seating, though. Uh, it's also a dine-in theater. Let's hope my Regal opens soon. I, here's the thing. This is my what I say to most people, Django, um, is this. And Rob, t- tell me what you think about this. I honestly think if you go to the grocery store, right, you do the right things. You wear the mask. You sanitize, you maintain social distancing, you do what you need to do in a grocery store. I actually think that there's you're in much higher risk going to a grocery store than you are going to a movie theater where you're just... Because in a grocery store, you're moving, you're going up and down where 5,000 other people have gone up and down in the last 30 minutes and blah, 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 blah. But you're doing the smart things. Maintaining social distance, sanitize, wear the mask, they're wiping down the carts. I think if you feel comfortable doing that, I think you'll probably feel comfortable going into uh, a static environment like a movie theater where you're sitting certain distance from people. Hopefully they got hand sanitizer there. You put on the mask, you maintain social distancing. But listen, I'm not going to say you're being foolish for being cautious. Being cautious is smart. But again, to me, if I can go to the grocery store, I feel like I can go to the theater. Rob, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, you, you make a good point. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting, if whether I'm going to our local Trader Joe's or whether I'm going to Vaughn's, like our Vaughn's, there's somebody standing outside the Vaughn's with hand sanitizer, and they're they're wiping down shopping carts when they're being used. And like you get scored with hand sanitizer when you walk in. They make sure people go in one way, come out the other. I mean, I, I've been impressed by by what they've done at my local grocery store, and I feel relatively safe, and the people in there are – mindful and and i think that they're gonna have to do that at movie theaters too because look a lot of the movie theaters have moved over to self-serve concessions like we've talked about on this show soda fountains for instance i mean you still go behind the counter to get your popcorn or something but you know you got people walking up to soda fountains and and using their hands and filling their sodas and their cups and everything and i want to make sure that that i feel safe doing that because that's part of my ritual of going to a movie is getting a, a soda there. I don't, I don't, I believe in supporting movie theaters by buying their, their drinks or their concessions. I like it. It's part of, you know, I, I find it to be comforting and I want to make sure that it's safe when you go there. And I think that movie theaters can, can do that. You know, they already have people cleaning the auditoriums after each show for the most part. And, um, you know, they're going to have to do that to bring those businesses back to make people safe. So we'll All see. Right. Well said. All right, next up, uh, Damo Davies also writes, whilst in lockdown in the UK, I have recently rewatched The Iceman from 2012. Aaron Cummings is in that. Uh, with Michael Shannon, Chris Evans, and Winona Ryder. I didn't realize Aaron Cummings was in this film until this rewatch or didn't know who she was before now. Great movie. But, but yeah, but Damo, here's the thing. Like, you didn't know. I don't know about, like, I have been friends with, me and Aaron have been friends for 10 years. And I, I mean, we, I go to her house. She comes over here. We, I mean, we say she was in my movie, like, and half the time, I don't know about things she's in until like, I've told the story about Rob, about her, uh, being in the disaster artist with James Franco. Right. We've talked about that. So like me and Anne are sitting in the movie theater, watching the disaster artist. And then all of a sudden I think that's Aaron. And then Aaron comes in. She's in this big scene with, with everybody. I get on the phone. I, how come you didn't tell me I'm watching, um, Uh, The other big example of that was I was watching The Blacklist. It's one of the shows that I watch, and I'm watching Blacklist. And all of a sudden, the main co-star of one of the episodes, like the main character of one of the episodes, that's Aaron. And I'm like, how the hell do you not tell me you're in this? So don't feel bad about it, Damo, because I'm, I, I know the girl. I know the girl and I'm constantly finding out shit she's in without like, and not finding out from her. All right. Nick writes, but John, uh, did you hear, uh, we got this covered, wrote about a new Disney plus show about John Campia's character in the Hulk. Also, thanks for the Zevia recommendation. Big fan of Dr. Zevia. Bring on the filthy. And, uh, yeah, I had to go downstairs and refill my Zevia. Zevia Cola. Sponsor me, you sons of bitches. That's my new slogan. Sponsor me, you <laughs> sons of bitches. Uh, I give you so much free publicity. All right, Ash writes, Hey, gang, I was just wondering if you have seen uh, Anne with an E on Netflix. I think it's amazing and definitely worth the watch. Have not. Rob, have you seen it? I, I think the last time we talked about it, I don't think you'd seen it either. I ha- I haven't either. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, that's the Anne of Green Gables incarnation. Um, if I'm thinking of the right one, Anne of Green Gables, obviously a huge, massive Canadian export. It's it's a hugely massive, popular thing. Uh, it's Anne of Green Gables is huge in Japan. Actually, Rob, when I went to Prince Edward Island, 
uh, PEI. It's one of the smallest provinces in Canada. But I went there uh, for vacation once and it's like there's bilingual signs everywhere in English and in Japanese because the Japanese tourism just makes that place. So I've not seen it yet myself, Ash, which as a Canadian, I probably should uh, if it's the right one, but I have not seen it yet. All right. Uh, Jordan Matthews writes. Hey, John, been watching your channel for about two years now. Thank you so much, dude. And finally decided to become a Patreon member. Thanks for all the great work, Jordan. Thank you so much, man. We appreciate that. And I don't plug our Patreon campaign. Always, I feel sheepish about plugging our Patreon campaign. I don't know why. But we do have a Patreon campaign, and we have so many cool people that are Patreon members. And it's just an awesome honor to have you. Jordan, thank you so much for supporting the content that you like. And I really appreciate that, man. And welcome aboard. All right. Uh, make sure you join our uh, Make sure you join our uh, uh, Facebook group because you're going to get that invite in the email. All right, Saber Wolf writes, guess the movie, my gun versus your Walter PPK, each of us with a 50-50 chance, six bullets uh, to your one, I only need one. It sounds like an Eastwood thing. It sounds like an Eastwood thing. Rob, do you know that one? My gun versus oh. your Walter PPK, each of us with a 50-50 chance, six bullets to your one, I only need one. Do you know that one? I, I You know, Walter PPK is James Bond. I mean, I it to me, I would say like Scaramanga said that the man with the golden gun, but I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. I would put ten bucks just because it's you. I would put ten bucks on you being right, just because it's you. <laughs> I would put ten bucks on you being right about that. All right, uh, Daniel Haygood writes. Shout out to to John for getting me on the Zevia train. Hope you get some sponsorship deals again, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. The new the new slogan for the John Campia show. Zevia Cola, sponsor me, you sons of bitches. That that's the new thing. Uh, Zevia, I give you so much publicity. But to their to their credit, though, they did ship me one free case of Zevia. They just, out of nowhere, they just shipped me a case of Zevia, which is which is really quite nice of them, and I appreciated that. All right, Peter's Tingle writes. Hey, John, on yesterday's show, I heard you debate Rob about Disney Plus covering Daryl Hannah's rear in, in Slash. In Canada, Disney Plus, yeah, we just covered this. In Canada, Disney Plus has done this, but for X-Men films on Disney Plus in Canada, all the nudity and F-bombs remain attack makes the decision seem odd. Again, that's before they made the decision or decided how they were going to handle that stuff. And it's when it's not in the U S market yet. I guarantee you when they do get the, when they do work out the rights issues and it's time to debut those things on Disney plus in the United States, I guarantee you they're going to take that stuff out or, or, or deal with it one way or the other. Like they didn't take out the scene of Daryl Hannah, but they, they made an adjustment to it. I guarantee you they will make adjustments to that before it airs on Disney plus here or They'll just forego it on Disney Plus and put it right to Hulu. I mean, who knows what they'll do with that? Uh, Angel M writes, hey, John, there is a drive in that's that's open not too far from you inland in Montclair. Really? Lately been doing double headers and showing knives out. Jason Reitman even posted on his Instagram account. I am immediately Angel. As soon as this show is done, I am immediately going to go and look that shit up because I think I know what me and my wife are going to do tonight. Because if that's true and it's open now, I may have to go and check that out because I've been looking for for uh, for stuff like this. Rob, what do you think about that? Well, I can, uh, I wanted to say there's breaking news. Oh, breaking that it news! Dropped, the news dropped eight minutes ago, and I had to bring this up. Please do. <laughs> They've rescheduled New Mutants. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, it's scheduled for August 28th now. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, this is on deadline, John. The much-delayed former Fox Marvel, The New Mutants, is not going to Disney Plus or Hulu and remains on track for a theatrical release now set for August 28th this year. <laughs> well, you know what's funny? August 28th, just, bro. <laughs> uh, well, I, I mean, hey, at least it's coming. I had this debate the other day because there were some people saying, John, did you hear it's official? They're putting it straight to streaming. I'm like, why Why do you say that? And they said, because Amazon accidentally had the pre-order up there. And I'm like, yeah, but that's happened before with other movies that do go to theaters. I mean, they've they've often put up early pre-order stuff on their stuff. I don't think it means, I mean, it might go straight to streaming. It might, but that doesn't mean it's going straight to streaming. So I guess that's true. Okay, guys. Very I'm, sure I'm very excited, John. Very for exciting. now until it gets bumped again but august and they're being kind of aggressive with it too they're not like putting it off to february they're actually being aggressive with it they're putting it out in august uh, so they're putting yeah. it out around wonder woman that's yeah, well, that's interesting yeah. 
Okay. All right. Well, I, let's let's go more into that on tomorrow's show. We'll go more into that on tomorrow's show. Um, anyway, let's keep moving on here. Thanks for bringing that up, Rob. Uh, Tucker writes, hey, John, uh, tonight is the Survivor all winners season finale. I have loved this show for so many years. And tonight is the Super Bowl of Super Bowls for Survivor fans. I cannot wait for it. Yeah, I remember. I think, Tucker, you wrote in about that before. And I'm like, I didn't even know that show was still on. Like, I was enamored as enamored with that show in its first season. I was much younger, but I was enamored with that show the first season. I think Richard Hatch um or yeah yeah was was that the guy like the guy the devious dude won and all that kind of stuff and uh, but i don't think i've ever watched it again since but clearly it's still on like season 95 or something like that (laughs) and clearly it still has a fan base and the idea of them bringing all the winners together for a big thing that's that does sound like a super bowl event if you're a fan of that stuff so awesome man i'm glad you're enjoying it right hitchcock is the goat uh, right. I know Lucasfilm is 99% Star Wars, but there is that little thing called Indiana Jones. I'm 48 and my kids and I are dying for young Indiana Jones. That's three seasons of content from the early 90s that Disney Plus can use, not to mention where are the films? Rob, what do you think they're going to do or should do or, or any of that with young Indiana Jones at this point? Or should they do anything? Well, you know... I, I, Sean Patrick Flannery, there was there was various in young Indiana Joneses. There was a really young Indiana Jones, and they sort of dispensed with him, and then they went with the Sean Patrick Flannery Indiana Jones. I I liked it, but I I, I this idea that that the kid incarnations of heroes, I've never really been down with. I mean. I remember seeing young Sherlock Holmes, and I really loved young Sherlock Holmes. I I, I did enjoy that, but but in in Last Crusade, it always bothered me that the the opening sequence is, is it's like Indiana Jones becomes Indiana Jones in one day. Here's how he got the scar on his chin. Here's his f- fear of snakes. You know, River Phoenix was playing young Indy, and and he did a good job, but they always have to like compact the whole character into like one sequence or one movie here's how the character was he was forged in this film and he emerged fully formed into the person you know today i've never really dug that and while i'll watch a young indiana jones thing i mean you know if they're gonna do it again i guess but it's not my favorite thing dude got it all right well said uh the monster curator writes hey john and friends Thanks. Uh, thank you for being a great movie fan. I've been inspired by you and what you do. So now I am planning on starting a channel with my friends about movies, uh, about movie monsters and discussing them in depth. That sounds like a great idea. Um, so the question is, which movie monster do you love? Oh, God. I mean, listen, there's so many movie monsters to know and love everything from the classics of course the universal classic ones to even modern mythologies of monsters and things like that like the, yep. the rancor and return honestly one of my favorite movie <laughs> monsters ever is the rancor and return of the jedi i just love that thing even though all it takes is luke skywalker shoving a little bone in his mouth okay that's fine whatever i love the rancor um so there's a lot rob i mean when you look at the issue of, like movie monsters if you had to say pick one or two that is like the ones that really resonate with you that have always just been your favorite amongst all the great ones out there uh which would you say those are well the creature from the black lagoon is up there because when i was a kid i loved the design but also when i was a kid i you only glimpsed it for a second but the martians from the original war of the worlds i thought with their suction fingers and the three colored (laughs) eyes and they, they had the coolest ships and they were so scary and they killed a priest You know, in the opening of War of the Worlds, I was like five years old, and I I thought my best friend was Catholic. I'm like, they're not going to kill a priest, and they do. The Martians just, (laughs) though though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Bam, you should fear the Martians because they don't care about your God. They killed a priest. So the Martians from War of the Worlds, um, but also Rodan. The kaiju Rodan. I knew the, I would have been disappointed the, if you didn't say that. Dude, the first Rodan, man, that movie is scary. It's first like an alien movie, the first part of it. And then it turns into a giant monster movie and it becomes like, I I, I didn't cry, but I was deeply saddened when I first saw Rodan. Again, when I was like five or six years old. And uh, it's still my favorite of all the kaiju films. And I, I, uh, I love it. I love Rodan. 
That's a good one to bring up. And by and again, dude, that's a great idea for a YouTube channel. Talking about specifically monsters, movie monsters. I think that's a terrific idea. Best of luck with that, dude. All right, next up, Murray Reich writes, I have to admit I was disappointed in the Flash season finale. Ending was very anticlimactic with no payoff. I understand they had no choice due to the pandemic. It's just frustrating to, to end it like that on a cliffhanger. Now, I haven't watched the finale yet myself, but for those of you who don't know what's going on, the Flash, like many other shows, had to cut short its production, and then they had to make the decision, well, we're just going to have to make one of the earlier episodes in our plan, the finale for the year. And so we kind of knew that that's going to put them in a position through no fault of their own that you're probably going to have a little bit of a dissatisfying ending to the season. Now, listen, this season hasn't been my favorite by any stretch of the imagination, but I thought this was a pretty good season uh, of it too. So I haven't watched the finale yet. And so I'll probably do that at some point later today. But we knew that was coming. And again, it, it is unfortunate, Murray, but there, was, there wasn't much they can do. Once they pull the plug on your production half when you're not even done yet, you got to scramble. Like the Blacklist, half of their season finale, they're cutting it short, the season short, and then half of their finale is going to be animated. They're doing like the stop motion graph, uh, graphic novel style to fill in the gaps of the stuff they weren't able to shoot. I mean, it's not ideal, but you come up with the creative ideas you can just to get through it. All right, Mr. Hoover writes, Hey, John, I saw you were talking about Amazon possibly buying AMC. I wonder, though, if they will do, if they do, will there be a different cut from the movie studios and the theaters? Example, 60-40 split. If so, how would this affect actors and studio salaries? Thoughts? They No, if, if they were to do that under strict competition laws, they wouldn't be able to treat their own movies any differently. They would have to do their own movies the same way they do all the other movies. But to them, it wouldn't matter because AMC, it doesn't matter if they make the cut 90-10 or 5-95. It wouldn't matter because it's all money going into Amazon one way or the other. So they will probably stick with the same deals and do that on their on their book work there. That is my assumption at this point. I don't know that for sure, but that is my assumption at this point. Uh, Brandon Entwistle writes, I live in New Zealand and after a long lockdown, we are finally leaving lockdown today. Congratulations, man. That is awesome. I like I like everything everyone else here have been very excited to get back to the cinema but unfortunately we have no fresh films to show here so we will be waiting for a lot longer well listen man though uh, rob you and i have talked about this yes getting back to the movie theaters man i'm just looking forward to going back to my favorite restaurant or hanging out at my favorite outdoor patio with with a couple of drinks and, and my ipad and working on the outside and, and a patio i mean all that kind of stuff so Maybe you have a little while to wait, but hey, man, at least you get to go in and enjoy some library content that they we just get back into the theater again. So congratulations to you guys. Rob, what's the I'm just curious, assuming that a movie theater isn't the first thing that opens, what's going to be the first thing you do whenever the, you know, the lockdown gets lifted? What's going to be the first thing you do? Well, you know, there's a there's a local pub, Lucky Baldwin's, that's a couple blocks away from my house and they are dog friendly. So you can walk your dog and I like to sit outside and they actually make chicken breasts with nothing on them specifically for dogs. So my dogs That's love so to nice. go. Yeah, they love to go to Lucky Baldwin's and we'll go sit outside. Elizabeth and I will go and we'll sit outside and the, I'll walk the dogs there and they love hanging out and they love they love getting those chicken breasts. And, I, you know, I love the bartenders there and I just like sitting outside. I get a beer and a double Jameson while the dogs eat. And then I walk back home with them and it's, you know, it's a nice sunny day in Pasadena. And I just miss, I just miss chilling. I miss walking around town. You know, there's, there's great places in Pasadena to walk to. And I like seeing people going to and fro and going places and doing things. And it, it's just, it's, it, I hate, I hate, I mean, I haven't really, other than going to the grocery store, dude, I've been like in my house the whole time. Yeah. I want to get the hell out of here. Yeah, going to the gro going to the grocery store and just taking our dogs for a walk around the block. I mean, that's that, uh, yeah. that's that's been it for for, for a few months. Uh, okay, uh, next up, David Crabtree writes one of two. A lot of people will seem offended when I say I believe that all film is subjective. They'll get very defensive. They'll say, no, there are objectively good and bad films. I'll ask them what unit of measurement, that sounds like something I would say, what unit of measurement and apparatus they empirically measure to, uh, to, to they empirically measure said quality. They'll then list off a, a set of standards and I'll retort that those are all personal sets of standards, but they are not universally objective. Then they'll say I'm an idiot or something else constructive. I hey, listen, dude, you know me. I won't. I am tempted to go into my full rant again uh, about the whole thing. But 
uh, all film is subjective. You know my position on this. All film is subjective. If you can't em empirically measure something to show it objectively as a fact, then it is up to individual opinion and taste. Uh, now, there are other people who have different opinions of that. Rob is one of them, as a matter of fact. But uh, yeah, I'm with you, David. I'm I'm with you. All right, Edward Wells writes, New York City lockdown extended to mid-June. I don't see Tenet and Mulan keeping their release date. Again, though, the, the one of the things that the, the Solus producer said about their upcoming movie Unhinged is that we recognize that maybe not all cities are going to be ready to open by that. But hey, listen, if the lockdown, if the lockdown is extended to mid-June, if, and that's a big if, if they do end the lockdown in mid-June, that gives them another two weeks after the lockdown ends before Unhinged is set to open in theaters and a full month before Tenet. So Tenet, theoretically speaking, and guys, again, this is a giant if. If it does open mid-June, that's still a full month until Tenet opens up. Again, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying it's, it's I mean, the timetable would theoretically line up, but anything can happen. But Rob, I don't know. If they do, let's say New York City, by whatever stretch, ends the lockdown mid-June. Do you think that gives them enough of a ramp-up time to, to get like a July 17th tenant out in theaters? Or do you think that might be cutting it too tight? <clears throat> No, I, I look, they're going to know, like we talked about yesterday, I, I, I think that um, mid-June would be the cutoff point, but they can start ramping up. They're going to have to start. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a new tenant trailer drop in the next two weeks because they're planning mm. on having it come out. I mean, they're going to have to start ramping up that ad campaign. Then we're going to see TV spots and all kinds of stuff. And um, I, I, they're, I think they're going to they're gonna go for it. But if they don't, you know, it depends. We're supposed to get definitively, we're supposed to find out whether we're sheltering at home, if the sheltering at home order stays in place in uh, Los Angeles, Los Angeles County uh, today until what, August? They said yesterday it might be till August, but nobody officially came out and said it yet. It might be. So who knows? But they're also allowing certain businesses to open up. I mean, our shelter in place order was until May 15th. And now they've put out guidelines of how to open up businesses and things like that. So so we'll see. But All right. they got to start ramping that, that up if they expect it to get out there. By the way, I want to see a new tenant trailer. So let's let's uh, yeah. I want to see one. You and me both, bad. All right. Uh, an anonymous viewer writes in, regarding the discussion on hiding offensive content and protecting parents' right to decide what to show their children, thoughts on European public TV showing naked people on primetime soap and, lo and lotion TV commercials. I live in Europe. I have no opinion on it. Look, listen, it's one of those situations where if... If a culture society decides that this is our kind of standard, that if, stuff, if something's going to be available to anybody to watch at any time, we have to monitor that. I'm okay with that. I understand. If you want to be a European culture where it's like our position on this is at a certain time, we can broadcast even everything publicly. Okay. I understand that too. See, to me, it's just a matter of, I get it. Which, whichever side of the argument you're on, I get it. But if you're in, if you're here and you're saying, this is how we do things here, you know, on broadcast television, we only show certain things and by extension this, then I'm cool with that. Follow through with it and I'm cool with it. If you go the other way and say, we're going to do it this other way, I'm cool with that too. And I think there's good arguments to be made for both. So I don't really have a position on that um, so much. All right. J-H-J-A writes, Hey, John, I'm a care worker over here in the UK, and you're, well, first of all, thank you for being a care worker, man. That's awesome. Um, and your videos help me give a moral, a morale boost when I come home. I was wondering, what are your favorite TV shows that are from the UK? I recommend Doctor Who and Misfits, and for comedy, The Inbetweeners. Well, I mean, listen, I, I'm going to admit, I haven't watched, I don't have a huge pantheon of British television that I've watched um, in my lifetime. So some that really stand out to me um, are... Faulty Towers, obviously. It's one of the shortest lived, but one of the greatest television comedies of all time. Um, the um, uh, 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 Why Am I Freezing on Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright show? Spaced? Spaced. Spaced. Spaced was great. Um, and recently, there uh, there's the BBC America one, Killing Eve. Uh, which I love that, which is British produced. There is the other one with... Um, uh, with John, not John, with Robert Snow, uh, with the bodyguard, with the one who's the bodyguard, the government bodyguard. What's the name of that show again on Netflix? It, oh, it's called Body. It's just called it's Bodyguard. Called body, it's called Bodyguard. 
that was a real surprise. So I'm not it. fully fluent on a lot of UK television stuff, but some of the stuff I have seen and really like. Rob, I, I, you, you've you watched a little bit more of that stuff than I do. Do you have any particular British produced television stuff that really stands out to you? Well, most of it's, you know, older stuff like The Prisoner and things like that. But, you know, there's so many great BBC shows. I've been watching a lot of the Harlan Corbin mysteries that are being produced, like the 10 episode things that are on Netflix that they're that are based on his books and they're all pretty good you know they're all british shows and they're usually 10 part shows but um those are the things i've been watching the most of and then bbc's you know killing eve is a basically a, it's a british show and i really like that as well i love killing eve i i, I, I was too. so i didn't think it looked all that good and then i watched the first like two episodes and i'm like i'm hooked Ann and I both got hooked on that show. But I, you know, John, I also love things like Broadchurch. Have you watched Broadchurch? No, that's a show my dad watches. My dad watches. I'm pretty sure that's the one one of the shows my dad watches. So I haven't seen it myself, but my dad was into that. I really like that. It made me want to move there. I want to go move to that town. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And by the way, I I just I just realized that uh, HJA uh, sent that in as a fifty dollar tip. So thank you so much for that HJA. And not only have we answered your question here, but I'm going to make it its own standalone video in the next couple of weeks. Keep your eyes open for that. So thank you again for supporting the channel on that level, HJA. All right. Uh, Harry Rayhausen. There you go, Rob. We got Harry Rayhausen writing in. Uh, could Deadpool be brought into the MCU via Doctor Strange? Maybe Strange goes into the multiverse and he takes Deadpool out uh, to the X-Men universe and into the MCU. Of, of course, in theory, you could do that. But it all comes back to, Rob, it, it's just nobody ever wants to believe Kevin Feige. Um Kevin Feige made a very definitive statement when the whole deal was going down about X-Men and and Fox getting acquired by Disney. Kevin Feige put out a very definitive statement that nobody believed. And everybody believes like the next MCU movie, we're going to get X-Men. The next one's going to get X-Men. The next we're going to see X-Men post credit scene and end game and all that kind of stuff. Kevin Feige made it pretty clear. Listen, I've got five years planned right now. I've got the next five years planned. And we will work, we will deal with X-Men when it comes time to deal with X-Men. But he's not going to change his entire thing for his Doctor Strange movie because now we got to introduce X-Men. Kevin Feige said, I've got my plan. And he, of course, can make some minor adjustments. But to do such a major story shift um, for something like that in a movie like Doctor Strange, I don't see him doing that. He seemed pretty adamant about it, but I don't know, Rob. I mean, in theory, that idea could work in theory, but do you see Kevin Feige doing that? Or do you think Kevin Feige is going to stick to his guns and say, I've got my plan. We're just going to stick with it. What do you think he's going to do? I think he's going to stick to his plan. I mean, look, it's not like he's having a problem making some cash. The The MCU has been a, a, a beyond a phenomenal success, and they're going to stick with what they know. They're not going to disrupt their plans. Uh, I, I now, by the way, I think we're going to see the Fantastic Four before we see the X Men. Just, I, just I agree. saying. Well, I mean, also because the Fantastic Four don't present any story problems. Like the X Men right. presents a big story problem. Where the hell have the mutants been? They're supposed to have been around for ages. Where have they been? That's not there. And by the way, this is a good example of where you and I both think in like the next Ant Man film, but we don't even know when that's going to be. But they're they're doing another Ant Man film. We think they're probably going to introduce Fantastic Four there, whether as a main story point or as a minor little thing at the end of the film, just as a tease. So, but uh, we'll see. All right, next up here. Uh, Diamond Dogs Puppy writes, one of two. Hi, John. Underappreciated film for today. 2006's Blood Diamond. I love Blood Diamond. That's great. It's one of Leonardo DiCaprio's best performances. A tragically underappreciated, because Leonardo DiCaprio was so good in that, everybody overlooked Jaiman Hansu in that. Jaiman Hansu so good in that. Anyway, Blood Diamond. Always felt it was overshadowed that year by The Departed, which it was, and it was wonderful, by the way. Leo really played against type as tough. No nonsense mercenary. He and Jaiman were both nominated for Oscars for the film. The great Edward Zwick did a killer job. Wonderful cinematography, intriguing characters, explosive action, and a story that is still prevalent today. A shame you hardly hear it talked about today. Thoughts? If I'm not mistaken, Rob, was Blood Diamond not also nominated? I believe it was nominated for Best Picture. I think I it got think nominated for Best Picture. I think it was too. I liked Blood Diamond a lot. I thought it was really good. What did you think about uh, Leo's uh, performance in it compared to you know what he did in Departed? Well, uh, look, obviously he was doing the South African accent, wasn't he? You know, which is a little, little kind of. I, I you know, I've I don't think I've ever seen a Leo DiCaprio performance that I didn't enjoy. Like I just like him as an oh, actor. Yeah. 
and I, and I love The Departed. I do love The Departed, but you know, Blood Diamond was kind of a stretch for him, and I I I, I liked it. I mean, I wouldn't oh. compare and contrast them, but I I did like the film and I liked his performance. By the way, I was incorrect. Uh, while Blood Diamond was nominated for five Academy Awards, including Best Sound Editing, Sound Mixing, Best Film Editing, Best Supporting Actor for John Van Hansu, and Best Lead Actor for Leonardo DiCaprio, it was, in fact, not nominated for Best Picture. I could have mm. swore it was nominated for Best Picture. I did, too. But, but uh, apparently, it was not, so I stand corrected. But yeah, there you go, Diamond Dog. I, 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 I thought it was a really solid film. I don't like it as much as The Departed, but it's a Blood Diamond is a really, really good film. All right. Uh, next up, GM writes, coming soon, Star Wars. Uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, Diamond Dogs Puppy writes, hey, also, John, I will have to be one of the insufferable voices joining the choir, the choir of Ozark. It is truly amazing. Where are you at on your rewatch attempt, Diamond Dog, over and out? Uh, I, I I have not gotten around to it. Like, uh, it's it's pretty far down my list, but it is on my list. Like, for those of you who don't know what he's talking about, I Ann and I binged the first, like, three or four episodes of Ozark because we're really big fans of Jason Bateman. Um, and we thought it looked interesting and it just wasn't for us. And so we tapped out on it and I haven't seen anything of it since the first few episodes, but so many people love this show now. And so many people are writing in that. I think Ann and I have both kind of agreed that at some point we're going to sit down and pick it back up again and see if maybe we get back. Because honestly, I didn't like the first episode of Legion and I ditched on the show after the first episode, but everybody kept telling me, John, go back to it. It really does get better. And then I went back and I ended up loving the first season. So I will have to get back on that at some point. All right. Lee Mallinson writes, uh, am I right in assuming Tenet will spend considerably less on marketing because of lockdown? I can't imagine there's any Super Bowls uh, going to, going ahead for TV adverts. Giant, uh, costly banners in Times Square and on highways are pointless as they are mostly empty too. Robin, he raises a good question here because... We look, they still need to market this movie, but do they have to spend as much as they normally would on marketing? And I would say probably not. But the main reason I don't think they need to spend as much on marketing as they normally would is because they're not trying to compete with the marketing of other films. Right. It's, it's like part of the marketing thing is how do you get your movie's message to stand out from all the other movies' messages that are being poured out there? Right. They don't have to deal with that. So I think they will do a strong marketing campaign, but I don't think it has to be a traditional marketing campaign. I don't think they have to spend that much. How do you see it? Well, here's the thing. It's not just it's not just marketing tenant. It's marketing the idea of getting back to the movies in general. That's true so too. I, so yeah, so I think that their tenant marketing campaign is going to is going to have to be that uh, uh, there's got to be something in it that 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 they're they're going to be actually marketing the entire idea of the movies again to a public that hasn't gone in a while, and I don't know <laughs> if that's going to be a conscious choice, but I mean, look, Tenant Tenant looks dope, and I, I I can't wait to see it. We saw that opening that IMAX sequence. Uh, I I I just can't wait. But I I think they're going to have to do the same thing. Maybe they're they're going to have to pound the idea into all of us that movies are coming back. And so I think we are going to be saturated. I hope not to the point where we're sick of hearing about Tenant, but uh, they're they're going to have to come after all of us and be like, "Get to the movies, dickheads! It's all good, you know." <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to the that's the that's your advertising campaign right there. Get to the movie, dickheads! All right, uh, last couple of questions we got for Rob because I just realized the time, so we're going to have to let Rob go here pretty soon. Um, ben Rayner writes, "Hey John, when you're watching TV and movies, what's the most important thing to you that they get right in them?" For me. Uh, for me, for films, as long as they get the story right, I'm happy. For TV, it's all about the characters. As long as the characters are well done, I'm good. How about you? I, honestly, there is no answer to that. Like, to me, a a visual story, be it uh, television or movies, it's like a chef putting a dish together. You know, you can use pork. You can use peppers. You can use chicken, you can use spinach, you can use salt, you can use, uh, you know, whatever other spices you want. There, there are a lot of tools at the disposal of a chef to put a dish together. And each dish will be its own thing. So you look like at a movie like Hangover, right? It, it, like, yes, sometimes characters are more important to me in television, like Supernatural. All I care about on Supernatural is the characters. I just love Sam and Dean Winchester, Castiel, and all that kind of stuff. But... 
Then again, you look at the movies like, like Rob, you look at Hangover. Hangover is not a great story. Hangover is just about these characters, these these crazy wild characters who have this really the uh, quirky uh, dynamic and relationship and I watch it for the character. So it can be true both. So I, I would say for me, Ben, in all honesty, I'm not trying to sidestep the question. There's no one thing. It's like sitting down to a dinner. I'm just going to sample the dish and different things will stand out to me depending on the dish. You know, when I eat a bowl of ice cream, I'm, I'm looking for different things than when I sit down and eat a filet mignon. It, it all depends. Rob, do you think you have a particular element that you really look for that gets you into a movie or a TV show? And is there a difference there for you? That's a good question. No, I, you know what I think it is? I think it's, it's first of all, I have to be attracted in some way, shape or form. I always say intellectually attracted to the premise or the story. There's got to be, and and I'm attracted to all different kinds of stories, but they have to, they have to bring me in based on whatever the story they're going to tell me and i'm i again if it's a, a historical uh, a true story or if it's a a compelling story set in a certain time or if there's something about the human experience that i'm particularly interested in i've got to be attracted to the story first and then it's everybody who was involved in making it like who, who directed it who stars in it but it's a combination of all of those things and so i i I don't make any, uh, it, whether it's books, whether it's movies, whether it's TV, it has to be the story itself and, and it has to somehow attract me from an intellectual standpoint. That's what gets me in. But then it's all about the execution. I mean, I'll watch right. anything. I'll watch anything about anything if it's well done. You can get me as, as uh, I don't have a uh, genre falls away from me. Look, I love science fiction, fantasy and horror. That's obviously a go to thing for me first. That's what I'm always interested in. That's what piques my interest. But show me a great war movie, you know, or show me a some some historical epic a sword and sandals pick like Gladiator. If it's well done or Rome, you know, the series Rome, I'm in. I Claudius from the BBC, mm, but, yeah, yeah. but, uh, you know, all, all those things, but it, it's a combination of stuff, I think. All right. Uh, next up, dark lock writes, watch justice league, dark apocalypse war. <laughs> um, no, I cannot recommend it. Well, that's, that's different. Cause we, we've heard from some people saying they really want to shut. I, I, again, I'm somebody that I'm not a big fan of either DC or Marvel's animated stuff. There are some exceptions. It's always important that I point that out. There are some exceptions that I do like from both. But for the most part, I'm not a big fan, so I'm very apprehensive about wasting my time watching it. But I've heard from some people that they really enjoy it. I'm hearing from some people, including you, Darth Locke, that maybe it's not kind of worth the go. But uh, I appreciate you adding your voice to the conversation of that. So thank you for giving me your point of view on that, Dark Locke. I appreciate it. Storm Chaser writes, I was wondering what your thoughts were on Disney mistakenly listing New Mutants as a PVOD pre-order. They didn't. That's the whole issue. Disney didn't mistake mistakenly do that hold on a second uh pre-order through amazon even though they still plan on releasing it in theaters thanks to keep up the filthy again the reason why when this story first broke rob that you saw a lot of reports new mutants going direct to, to video and we like it where are they getting that from well because amazon had posted a listing and i'm like and i reminded some people this has happened several times before this has happened many times before where like a very early pre-order information goes up on amazon sometimes they just wanted to put it up really early sometimes it mistakenly got put up put up for a second pull down but amazon often puts very long in advance pre-orders for movies so i i don't think this was a situation of disney accidentally did i uh, i don't think that was it rob do you, do you have a point of view on this no, because what happens is they schedule these things to go up based on the release dates of the movie. And the New Mutants had an original April, early April release date, and then this this order went up after. So to me, it was probably something that was automatic that was already scheduled in, and they just forgot to take it down after New Mutants was delayed. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it was anything nefarious like, uh-oh, you know, we're not getting there. No, I thought – I. I think it was completely an auto thing that was set up to drop at a certain point, thinking that New Mutants would have been out for two weeks already, and that's what happened. That's an excellent point, dude. That's a All right, last question today with Rob here because we got to let him go. Ethan Holgate writes, Hey, John, a biopic I can't wait to see is a Mike Tyson biopic. Jamie Foxx said he would be playing him a while ago, but do you think it will eventually happen? Also, thought the Unhinged trailer looked great, kind of looked like a, a falling down, which is what one I brought up to you, Rob, when we were talking before the yeah. show. It kind of looked a little bit like falling down. Um, You know, Rob, when it comes to the Mike Tyson biopic, 
pardon me, my my thoughts on it has always been, I'd be surprised if it actually happens. And the reason I'd be surprised if it actually happens, and I'd be interested in it, but the reason I'd be surprised if it actually happens is the same reason that I would be surprised if a Michael Jackson biopic ever actually happens. Because there are some very controversial elements surrounding Mike Tyson Mm -hmm. that if that I'm not so sure, like there's no way to properly portray it because you portray particularly stuff with his ex. If you portray it one way, you're going to piss off half the people who think you're covering something up. If you portray it another way, you're going to piss off the other half of half of the people who think you're doing something unfairly. And it just puts you as a filmmaker. That, that's why when it comes to a Michael Jackson biopic, I, I say, if I'm an executive, I don't green write it because I don't see a win. I don't see a path to a win in that situation. Every path leads to a loss. And I don't see the win here. And with Mike Tyson, I believe he is such a polarizing character that I just don't know if as a studio you see the win. I Because I, I, I don't know that there's a way, there's one way you could do the film, but I don't think Mike Tyson will let you do the film that way. There's another way you could do the film, but that might piss off a lot of people that you're, they'll, they'll accuse it of covering things up or whatever. I, I just don't know. Rob, could you see that? Because they they were look they were moving ahead. Jamie Foxx was on board. They had a writer for the film and everything. Then we haven't heard anything about it for quite a while. Do you think a Mike Tyson film is one that could ultimately get done? Uh, yeah, again, I think maybe. But dude, in this day and age, like you pointed out, there's a lot of let's call it problematic issues to surmount. So I wouldn't hold my breath. Right. I, I agree. Well, listen, Rob, you've been with us uh, quite a long time today. Thank you for that. And we will, of course, see you again on here. But, dude, in the meantime, where can people follow you and your tremendous adventures online? Well, you can follow me just just probably running down the street with flags screaming, New Mutants is coming, New Mutants is coming. <laughs> but other than that, you can find me on Twitter at Burnett RM. You can find me on Instagram at Robert Meyer Burnett. Or you can find me on my own YouTube channel, of, uh, uh, The Burnett Work, and my show, Rob's Observations. Rob, as always, it is an honor to have you here sharing your points of view and your deep encyclopedic knowledge of all things film. Thanks for being here, dude, and we'll see you again on the next show. All right, man. Take care, man. Guys, with that down, let's keep right on going here with your questions. We still got a few minutes left here, so let's barrel through as many as we can. Uh, Kevin Rubio writes, uh, (laughs) Kevin Rubio writes in, Rob may be fully accessorized, but it's all one-sixth scale. Indeed it is. He was talking to me just before we started the show about uh, some new one-sixth stuff he just ordered. You know, he and I got to get back to... I think once a week we should get back to Rob showing off one of his one six scale collection every week. We should do that. We used to do that when we were doing heroes. We should do that again. Cause I think that was a great idea. All right. Uh, anonymous viewer writes this whole debate. Um, of what's considered appropriate on Disney Plus is very fascinating. Myself, uh, allow my kids to see family-friendly movies, but movies like the MCU that have a strong PG-13 language like shit or son of a bitch that I can't show my little kids under 13. Uh, He goes on to say, uh, even showing some nudity, I find a little issue. I find a little issue for those ages in my family at least. I'm trying to do the best I can. Even some movies that are family-friendly are pretty scary like Return to Oz. That's true too. I hope you guys have a great day and stay safe. Hashtag bring on the filthy. And Anonymous, I think you raise a great point that I I think a lot of people struggle with. Everybody, all parents, I believe, uh, not being a parent myself, but all parents, I believe, are very different and unique in, in what do they consider appropriate for their kid. And I always find it funny that everybody has an opinion about what other people should do with their kids. I Anyway, uh, I have no opinion what somebody else should do as a parent with their kids. Uh, You do what you feel is best for your kids. But at any rate, I think you're you're expressing what a lot of parents would say. Like, like we're we're just figuring this out ourselves. We're trying to figure out what are we comfortable with showing our kids or not. Which is why I understand Disney Plus's position that they're like, look, we want to be a service where any parent can feel comfortable leaving the room with their kid watching Disney Plus, and they don't have to worry about what we're going to be dropping on the screen. I understand that position. I understand it if they did it a different way too, but I get where they're coming from because there are a lot of parents that struggle with that and are trying to figure out what they want for their kids. And for Disney Plus to say, hey folks, we have a product for you. We have our network, Disney Plus, that we feel you can feel safe letting kids sit down. But you bring up another interesting point here, Anonymous. An issue that comes up a lot is scary stuff in movies. 
right? There's some PG and PG-13 stuff. Like, for instance, Toy Story 3. Some parents felt like that whole incinerator scene might have been a little bit too intense for kids. And maybe there should have been a little bit of a stronger warning on that. So there are a million different aspects. And I, I think, Anonymous, you're just doing the best you can. And I think you reflect a lot of parents that are just trying to figure it out for themselves. What are they comfortable with? What are they not? And it's it's a, it's a challenging thing, man. I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. All right. Uh, anonymous viewer also writes in, are theater chains like AMC, Regal, etc., going to open when all cities are able to play movies? Because cities like New York City are big things theater markets and they're not even allowed to start phase one reopening till maybe the end uh, of may at least big gamble by studios well i mean like like the way one guy said from the studio behind unhinged they understand that some markets may not be able to open i think the movie theater chains like amc and regal would prefer to open nationwide all at once that's what they would prefer but if they can open 70 percent of their theaters then they'll do that you know, they don't want to open one AMC in one city and then then a few weeks later, two AMCs in another city. But if they can roll out, if the, if the member theaters of NATO can roll out, say, hey, we're going to be open, able to open 71% of our theaters by this date. Not in every market, but we're going to be able to do in that. I think they do it because they need to get their ball rolling where it's safe to do so. Uh, and once that happens, I don't think they're going to wait for 100%. I don't think they're going to wait for 100%. And would it hurt if New York can't be one of those cities? Yep, that'll hurt. But at the same time, they need to get moving on other things as well. If anything, opening in other markets will help the opening of the New York City market when it's time to do so. So yeah, that's what I think they're going to do. But we'll have to wait and see how it actually transpires. The situation changes every day, but it's a great question. All right, next up, Sam Fisher. What bothers me about the Battenson thing is that the studio asked him to do the training to bulk up and he's not. It's like uh, it's like of your boss at work asks you to do the quarterly reports while watching while, while, while at home and instead you sat on your ass watching TV. Sam, listen, I already expressed my feelings on it. You know how I feel. I think Robert Pattinson is a tremendous actor. And I know you watch the show, Sam, so you know I have been the biggest cheerleader waving that Robert Pattinson flag, that R Bats flag, going, yeah, Robert Pattinson's going to be Batman. This is going to be awesome. You know I'm super excited about him playing Batman. But as a fan of his casting as Batman, I feel tremendously disappointed. I feel tremendously disappointed. And it's on several levels. Again, you point out, dude, Warner Brothers is paying you millions of dollars. He is, they, Warner Brothers is paying you more money than I will ever make in my entire lifetime for one movie. And you can't be bothered when they say, we want you to work out. We've paid for this trainer for you. And the trainer's giving you instructions. Hey, <laughs> eh, can you pick up a weight? Maybe we're not expecting you to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. We're not expecting you to be Dwayne the Rock Johnson. We don't expect you to suddenly transform yourself into some chiseled Adonis looking God. We don't expect that. Just, just be the best version of you that you can be. Lift, lift some weights, you know, put a little effort into it. I, I, I consider it extremely insulting to the character of Batman, to the fans of Batman and to the studio that is paying him millions of dollars. Dude, if you're going to take on an iconic comic book, anyway, I, I, bleh, I'll resist going into the whole thing again. I, bleh, but I, it really bothers me. And you know what? If I wasn't so excited about Robert Pattinson playing the role, maybe it wouldn't have bothered me so much. But the fact of the matter is I have been so excited about him playing the role. I've been all for Robert Pattinson getting this role. And to, I, I feel like he's double, you know what it feels like? This is a little bit of hyperbole. Let me admit this right now. This is a bit of hyperbole. Just admitting that, okay? But it feels, I feel a little betrayed as somebody who's been so excited about him being Batman, then hear him go, eh, I don't care. I'm not, Zoe Kravitz is working out five days a week? Eh. Christian Bale got himself into great shape to play Batman for, for Christopher Nolan? Eh. Ben Affleck got himself in much better shape than who he was in previous to Batman vs. Robert Ben Affleck got himself bulked up for Batman vs. Superman. Eh, that's beneath me. Those other lesser people can do that, not me. I'm Robert Pattinson. I don't need. I, I just it, 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 anyway. Ah, I'm sorry. I'm going to go off on a whole rant again, and I'm, I'm just not going. I shouldn't do that. Um. Anyway. Uh, double X, your disease, right? So I love you, John, but you're overdoing it. Maybe he's trolling theater. Yeah, but you're here. Okay. Here's the thing. 
You're now you're making up a fantasy scenario to try to justify what he said. Maybe he's doing this. That's a fantasy scenario. Reading the GQ article, the, even the article writer saying uh, he's saying this about J James Dean, but Batman's Batman. Like even the article writer was like, uh, no. So yeah, listen, it says something. Double X your disease. If you need to make up a fantasy scenario to try to justify what he's doing, that tells you that what he said isn't very good, right? Can we admit? Can we agree on that? That if we have to say, maybe he's joking, then isn't that in and of itself an admission that what he said was pretty stupid in the first place? Can we, agree, can we agree on that? That if he was joking, and there's nothing there to suggest he's joking, but if he was joking, then we agree that the statement itself was pretty stupid, right? Anyway, let me let me finish reading what you're saying. Um, maybe he was trolling the interview viewer because we're in a pandemic and he's trying to stay safe. And he gave a sarcastic answer. Cavill took the Superman job for the money. Uh, his heart wasn't with the character, only his wallet. Oh, I oh I complete listen. I'll tell you this: triple X your disease. I have sat down with Henry Cavill. I have sat with Henry Cavill, and I've spoken with Henry Cavill on a couple of occasions, and. Henry Cavill loved playing Superman. He loved playing Superman and he worked his ass off for that role. I'm not saying Henry Cavill is the greatest actor in the world. I think he's a very good actor as a matter of fact, but uh, just, no, his heart was in it. He loves that character anyway. Uh, but Hey, listen, you got your perception of it and your perception is no more and no less valid than my own. So good on you, man. All right. Anonymous viewer writes, someone asked, and uh, uh, I, I I I have no I have no desire to talk about that. So I I, I hey I appreciate you writing in, but I've said I'm not going to speak on that situation more. I'm not going to give any more free air time to that to uh, that individual. Uh, a disappointed fan writes, John, you moan and whine about whiny man babies, and then go on a rant about Pattinson. I've watched you since the 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 closet days with Amy Rose and Dennis, but you honest, you're, you're shouting and childish in, in impersonations really bring down the child. Get Robert Meyer Burnett answers. Listen, all I can do is tell you how I honestly feel. And I think Robert Pattinson is a tremendous actor, right? And if I'm going to go on and on and gush about how great I think Robert Pattinson is and how perfect, well, maybe not perfect, but how, how ideal he is to play Batman, if I'm going to drone, if I'm going to go on and on and on about that, then when he does something that I think is really unprofessional and really insulting to the character and really insult, I'm going to go, I'm going to go off on that too. So if I'm going to say all this great stuff about him, I got to be honest and tell you all the negative stuff I feel by something he actually said. And I was really turned off by what he said. And I was hot about it. It's just funny. I was talking to Anne last night. Uh, when I read all this stuff, I was talking to Anne and I was telling her, I'm really hot about this because it, in terms of movies, we're talking about movies. This is first world problems, ladies and gentlemen. This is totally first world problems. But within our little world of movies, to me... This is, it's a really insulting thing to say, especially as somebody who has been so supportive of him to, say, to see him say, it's not worth my effort. I think like you may not think that's a big deal. And I respect that if you don't feel that's a big deal. I think there are many different points of view to have on this whole thing and I respect them all. But I'm saying my point of view on this, I found it extremely disrespectful to the studio that's paying him millions of dollars, to the fans who have been waiting to see this new incarnation of this iconic character and disrespectful to the character itself. To say, I'm not going to give you my best. I'm not going to give you my best. I'll do the things I'm comfortable doing, which is his, his acting and his performance. And I have no doubt his acting and performance is going to be really top shelf. I'll do the stuff I'm comfortable with. I'll do the stuff I'm used to doing. But this other thing, nah, that's for other people. Let other people do that. You know, it, it's... It may not be beneath Hugh Jackman or Gal Gadot or, or Alicia Vikander or Carrie Fisher or Mark Hamill. It may not be beneath them, but you know what? It's beneath me. It's beneath me. James Dean didn't have to get ripped. You know, I find that when you are in a position of privilege, like he is in, when you're in a position of incredible wealth and privilege to do what tens of thousands of other performers and actors only dream about doing. And when you're given that blessing, when you're given that opportunity to not say, I am going to do whatever you need me to do to bring the very best that I can. And if that means working out a little bit, 
I'm going to work out. If that means you're sending trainers over to my house, I'm going to work out then. I'm not going to ignore your trainers. I'm going to do everything that I can do to give my absolute best. When you don't do that and you're given an opportunity like that, I find that insulting. I find that insulting. And I, and I think fans of Batman should be insulted by that. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I'm suddenly not excited to see him as Batman. I'm not saying he's a bad guy. I'm not saying he's not going to give a good performance. All these things I've already believed he will. But I, I found that attitude not giving 100% to do something you're not normally comfortable doing when you've been given a trust by the fans when you've been given millions of dollars by a studio and you're given the care, the stewardship of an iconic character like Batman, I find that insulting. And if you don't, you don't. That's great. I'm not telling you you have to feel the way I feel. But I, I really do find it insulting, especially as somebody who's been the, who's been the biggest supporter of Robert Pattinson as Batman. I, I find it insulting. But that's just me. All right. Uh, Casper Arrow writes, Oh, shit. We're almost out of time. Uh, Casper Arrow writes, Hello, John. Just hear me out and let me ramble for a minute. Regarding Disney Plus and censorship, uh, you are saying that nudity, etc. are removed from movies when shown on TV. Therefore, we should not be upset that Disney Plus are doing the same thing. Well, that might be the... Okay, that might be the case in the U.S., but I will have you know that nudity, profanity, etc. are not, as in never, uh, removed from movies when shown on network TV in Denmark. Uh, and ass shot being removed or profanity bleeped out on Danish TV is simply unheard of. Uh, so what I am saying is, I know it's not exactly censorship, but it's so against the culture and norm of certain European countries to edit movies in a way that removes nudity and profanity. That's why it's such a big thing slash problem. I hope it makes sense. No, it does make sense. And that's why I was saying earlier... That like in other countries, like even in Canada, like on Disney Plus, they're showing an ass shot on Disney Plus in Canada. But Disney's main market is the U.S. And in the U.S., right or wrong, right or wrong, in the U.S., they have had certain standards about what broadcast television shows. And all I'm saying is, is if nobody's ever raised an issue and screams about television cutting the stuff out, why are they suddenly getting upset that Disney Plus is doing it when they see themselves as being family friendly, like what broadcast television is? Now, look, if they want to do it a different way, that's totally cool, too. But the U.S. is their main market. And in the U.S., right or wrong, their standards are there's certain things you don't show on publicly broadcast television that that kids can watch. And so Disney simply is doing what these other movies have always done. So it's fine. I understand they do it differently in different countries, and that's great. And I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong, but I'm saying Disney Plus's main market is the United States, and they're a United States-based company, and here the standards are a little bit different. So they've determined that they want their product to be something that parents can let their kids watch without having to worry or monitor them, monitor them watching that network. And if they didn't do that, I'd be fine with it. They are doing it, and I'm fine with that too. And if you're going to be in the United States and you don't have an issue with CBS, you know, modifying a movie for to be safe for broadcast, I don't see why there's any reason to be upset that Disney is doing it, especially when you can still go and watch that shot of a splash everywhere else that still has the bare ass shot. Anyway, I hear what you're saying, and I agree. I'm just saying there there are different standards in different countries. Whether there should or shouldn't be is up for debate. Uh, whether it's not an issue about which country is right and which country is wrong. The fact of the matter is that different countries and cultures have different standards. And so Disney is just doing what the standards have kind of been in their country. That's all I'm kind of saying. That's all I'm kind of saying. All right. Last question of the day. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Bob, the fart tart guy writes, irony. You're grilling Robert Pattinson on his birthday. Is it his birthday? Oh, uh, well, I should have I should have started off by saying happy birthday. Because despite my angry rant, I am a fan of Robert Pattinson, which makes it extra hurtful. The fact that I am a fan makes it hurtful. Uh, question. Would you rather see a Robert Pattinson Batman or have had Affleck return had he not been dealing with his own demons? Well, okay. To be honest, I would rather have seen Ben Affleck come back because... The, the problem here is that the Batman iteration that Ben Affleck gave us was different from Batman versus Superman to Justice League, right? They were two different Batman. I was not a huge fan of the Batman we got in Justice League because in Batman versus Superman, the first movie that he did as Batman, it was the only movie version of Batman I had ever seen 
that understood that Bruce Wayne was the fake, that Bruce Wayne was the fake mask and Batman was the true individual, right? Every other iteration, even the great Batman movies, every other iteration always played at that Batman or that Bruce Wayne was the guy. And then he puts on this persona of Batman, but at his core, he's really Bruce Wayne. He just puts on this persona of Batman. Ben Affleck's Batman in Batman versus Superman, one of the reasons it always impressed me so much was it understood that Bruce Wayne died uh, uh, what's uh, uh, theoretically. Bruce Wayne uh, metaphorically died in that alley with his mom and dad. And the Batman was born. A, a, a creature born of pain and vengeance and justice. And the way that Zack Snyder and Ben Affleck chose to portray that Batman was behind, when he's not around other people, he was Batman. And then when he would go out in front of people, he'd put on the mask of Bruce Wayne. And while I'm not saying that Batman versus Superman was a better Batman movie than The Dark Knight, obviously not. But I am saying that one element I really felt they captured. And because of that, I would like to see them do it. Listen, if you're going to ask me, you know I'm a big fan of Ben Affleck. If you were to ask me, who do I think is the better actor? I think the better actor is actually Robert Pattinson, um, even though I respect Ben Affleck as an actor very much. But I think if I had my choice, yeah, I would love to see Ben come back and play play and direct a Batman movie. But we don't. And so we got Robert Pattinson playing him, who's a terrific actor. And we got Matt Reeves directing, who's a terrific uh, actor. So in the absence of Ben Affleck doing both, I think we got a pretty good situation. So we'll just have to see how that all kind of turns out. All right, listen, guys, we have run out of time here. I've already gone over time. So there are still a bunch of questions to get to. So do not worry. We are going to do a companion video a little bit later today. We will get through all the rest of the questions that got sent in. We pretty much got through all the, the tip questions that came in. So we will just finish off the last one or two tip questions and then we will do all the super chat questions in a companion video a little bit later. We've already gone over two hours. Guys, thank you so much for being here for this installment of the John Campia Show. It is an honor and a privilege that you guys choose to spend a part of your day here with us as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movies and all kinds of stuff. Special thank you to all you guys who sent in the questions for two reasons. Number one, you gave us great fun things to talk about. Number two, you supported the channel while you did it. And all of us here on the John Campia YouTube channel Thank you for that. And of course, a special thank you to Robert Meyer Burnett for always bringing his expertise. And I love it when he and I have different points of view as well. So we get to debate those. So that's always great to have as all of us as film fans have different points of views on different issues. So guys, make sure whether you're talking to the chat uh, section of this video, whether you're off on Twitter talking to each other, make sure that guys, when you're talking to each other, you understand that you're talking to fellow film fans together, have some debate, have some disagreements, but just do so understanding you're talking to fellow film fans while you're doing it. All right, guys, that will do it for me for today. Thank you so much for being here. My name is John Campion, and until tomorrow, guys, bye-bye.